Welcome to the Lead Wasps podcast, the only podcast in the world that specifically hosts international infantry guests. This week your guest is Heston Russell, a former major from 2 Commando Regiment in the Australian Army. Some of the footage you are about to see is from his deployments fighting in Afghanistan and his organisation Voice of a Veteran. Use it to prime your mind for the discussion you're about to hear. And without further ado, the Lead Wasps podcast, episode 36, is live. adventure serving your country either way as soon as you join the military you're given a purpose outside of yourself you're taught to have whatever is motivating you whatever is fatiguing you to not be any matter before the mission or the men that you're there to support First and foremost, like contemporary veterans need to be helped tomorrow. So getting out there and saying, hey, there's some contemporary veterans who are taking up the cause for you and want to involve you with it, that's step one, to know that, hey, like someone's out there listening. Because when I was sitting on my couch and you having your moments, mate, you felt like that you're waiting for big brother, you're waiting for the system to fix it, but it's not going to happen. So we need to start helping our guys and girls, our peers tomorrow. But yeah, Heston Russell, thank you very much for taking the time to sit down with me. I know you're on the other side of the world and it's, uh, you're a very busy man at the minute, so I really do appreciate it. And I know the boys will be pumped to, to uh, uh, hear what you've got to say. Um, but we'll, we'll kick in with the, with the opener. And that's basically you just telling a little story about something that you've done while you're deployed or while you're in, in the army, about something that you uh, you done that you didn't want anyone to, to know about, but you're more than happy to admit to now. Uh, so fire away. Hey mate, thanks so much for having me on for starters. Oh, that's a that's a tough one. Uh, you know what? I'm going to go against the norm, and um, it was actually my very first deployment back in my um, rifle um, company infantry days. I was a platoon commander uh, with two R over in East Timor, 2007, 2008, and um, old mate Alfredo Ronaldo. I just done his assassination attempt on the prime minister and president, and I was fortunate enough to be the QRF platoon commander. And that was actually the first Hilo assault force I did up onto a, a Mount Icasa in Timor. And it was the warriest thing I'd ever done uh, as a first year infantry platoon commander. And I remember we, we landed in helicopters onto this, uh, onto this village and the guys went straight to their target compounds. And I was there with my SIG. And next thing I heard something making a, a big noise behind one of these buildings. So I had my F-88 old star up to my shoulder. You know, I was doing everything that I'd seen in the movies beforehand and... <laughs> I put my safety catch to instant. Uh, the noise got louder, the noise got louder. The next thing, something rushed out at me. And I literally took up the first uh, <laughs> trigger finger depression on my style as this giant pig ran out of me. <laughs> <laughs> I'd been ambushed by a pig, mate, and uh, no one knew it except for my SIG. And there were no shots fired. There were no shots fired that entire deployment. But um, to this day, my SIG kept his mouth shut. But he's, I caught up with him recently, um, oh, actually just a few years ago, and he's like, I just remember, boss, the, I was there when you almost shot a pig and almost this only shot fired our entire deployment. I was like, thanks, man. I fired a few more since then. But that was, imagine that. Imagine if I had actually shot a pig. Fuck, that would, that would have been good, good crack in a battalion, wouldn't it, if you were the only one to oh, to get rounds down range. You can just imagine, like, it was a, it was obviously it was a peacekeeping deployment, and that would have been the, one of the first shots fired that would have had all these incident reports gone out through all forms of strategic command level that Lieutenant Russell had fired his weapon and killed a pig. <laughs> Jeez, well, that's, a, that's a good one um oh, and i'm sure yeah. that's i'm sure that set you up late uh good for later in life where you deployed in, in afghanistan with his fucking bear dogs <laughs> i unfortunately i mean i actually that's an even interesting story you know when we were in afghanistan there's definitely a lot of dogs that we did actually have to shoot you know um they were big bloody things yeah uh, you know the last 
I once had a, one of my soldiers in Timor actually got um, bitten by a dog and had to go through all the, the tetanus boosters and shots and it just removed him from operational capabilities, you can imagine. But I now have, and he's probably going to come in and crash this party in a, in a minute, and almost, uh, he's just over one and a half year old mini dash hound sausage dog. And I actually was watching back some of my old Hemel cam footage the other day where I got off and shot a dog and I was like, if someone came here and shot my dog, <laughs> <laughs> you'd have a new generation of insurgents on your hands. Yeah, so, fuck. Um, yeah, I mean, the new level of empathy for people who don't know, just describe what a fucking bear dog is. Oh, they're like, mate, they're you know, up, up a picture, yeah, picture like a, a greyhound. If anyone's ever seen those x racing greyhounds, like they're big bloody things, but they're hairy, they're mangy, and they look like if they bite you, you know, it's toxic, like your leg's gonna fall <laughs> off, and they're not afraid to come at you. And they're also quite decisive when they decide they're gonna go at you. Um, so you know, it's like being charged by a bear, absolutely correct, but. You know, the biggest, particularly the biggest issue is once you get um, tetanus or rabies or the threat thereof, the, the needles in the stomach and all sorts of stuff are, are far worse than the bite itself. Yeah, and not only that, they're, they're almost always chained up at the, the entrance to a, to a target or a building or whatever, you know, as a, as a form of protection for, for the people. They living, are the early warning for the device, living there, yeah. that's it. Um, yeah. But fuck, man, the last thing you want to get, do is get bitten by one of those. Like you said, you think fucking, your leg's going to fall off. But um, yeah. if, if you don't mind, just give uh, give the listeners and the viewers a, a brief introduction as to as to who you are. Um, sure. Um, yeah. So obviously, my name is Heston Russell. I joined the army straight out of high school. Um, I'm, I'm obviously here in Australia, and I went to the Australian Defence Force Academy, uh, which is where we train to become an officer. And I joined army three years, and then one year at our Royal Military College, and then I graduated as a lieutenant up to our Townsville, our second battalion. Um, which is a, a light infantry battalion. I spent three years up there, including a deployment to East Timor. And then as the DFSW or anti-armoured platoon commander, um, which is actually when we brought the sustained fire machine gun, 50 cals into service and had the javelins and stuff like that. So that was cool. Then 2010, when I got promoted to captain, I went down to our second commander regiment, which is our um, East Coast base, Sydney based um, special forces unit. And I pretty much spent the majority of my career there, which included domestic counterterrorism duties, um, four deployments to Afghanistan, including protective security detachment, taking our first female prime minister over to Afghanistan as my first trip, um, through to uh, then Special Operations Task Group Rotation 18. We did something like 67 missions, 120, uh, killed 120 insurgents, captured over 200 more, um, lost <clears throat> one of my best soldiers, Corporal Scott Smith, to an uh, IED um, in Helmand, um, and then... Spent a few years bopping around Asia Pacific um, as per the Australian priorities to conduct our operational preparation and international engagement in countries like Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea, Malaysia, uh, Fiji, Thailand. Uh, then adjutant, then got deployed for a year on exchange to the US Special Forces, including their Rangers and another deployment overseas with their classified task force. Came back, ran our, uh, remodeled and, and ran our Special Forces selection course for commandos and support staff for about 18 months. And then the end of my career finished up my last deployment as uh, deployed to Iraq as uh, the Special Operations J5 or Joint Planner. Um, at that time, it was, you know, fighting Daesh, fighting ISIS. And it was in the final throes of Mosul. So that was end of 2016, start of 2017. And then got back, long service leave, got out. And here I am now. And my primary focus at the moment is supporting veterans with my um, brand, voiceofaveteran.org and advocating for veterans, particularly in a space whereby we're going through a few interesting pieces here in the uh, Australian media and the Australian defence culture. Yeah, damn, that's a, that's a long and distinguished list. Um, did you ever think that when you, were, when you were a kid that you'd ever have anything like that? Well, that's, no, I, I didn't. And I think as, as per all of us on here, you know, I was extremely privileged with um, having a, a fantastic career and fantastic life experience. And I was very fortunate to be in the right place at the right time for a number of those opportunities that I worked very hard for and made sure I was prepared for where they came along. But, yeah. you know, as we all know, mate, and this is a big part in our veteran community moment, I meet so many veterans who sit there and go, oh, I never deployed anywhere, I never did anything. But, you know, I, I signed up to serve. And then um, along the way came service that gave me a fantastic career. And as long as yeah. I worked hard at it, I was able to reap the benefits and learn from those. So I... To answer your question, absolutely not. I wouldn't change a single thing. And I'm so happy with who I am now and today. But now the responsibility is on me to put that to use instead of sitting there and telling people to buy me a beer every Anzac day. 
<laughs> Fucking hell. That's, uh, that's something I, I never want to encounter. And I'm glad we live in the UK where people don't buy you fucking, buy you a brute on uh, on Veterans uh-huh. Day or whatever. So it's kind of, no one really, you know, I don't think the public really gives a fuck to be fair here, but uh, it is what it is. Uh, I, I wouldn't really have yeah. it any other way. I don't, I don't want plaudits or that, but... Um, yep. What, what what was life like growing up for you as a kid then? Because, you know, outside of Australia, um, there's this stereotypical idea that kids grow up fucking chasing snakes and fighting kangaroos. Is, is that what it was like for you? Uh, <laughs> maybe a little bit, no. Um, my my dad was actually in the army. He joined as a, a soldier in artillery, became a bombardier and then became an officer. And he spent the majority of his career in uh, our parachute infantry battalion and he was a free fall instructor and all that. Uh, so I grew up with a couple of postings, including to the US as a kid and in and around a few states um, and always in and around army families and friends. And then uh, my mother's side of the family, her father, my grandfather, he just passed away this last December, but he was a he was a section commander and then a platoon sergeant on the hook in Korea. Oh, damn. And then he was... Uh, yeah, then he was the regimental sergeant major of one of our infantry battalions, 8 RAR, in Vietnam. Uh, wow. And, you know, he never really spoke to me about that until his latter years. But so the military was always in and around me. And I knew from an early age it's what I wanted to do. But I, born in Sydney, grew up in the suburbs of Brisbane. Yeah. Not many snakes, not many kangaroos. <laughs> um, plenty of urban jungle. But yeah, that's about it. And so I'm guess you I guess you're inspired completely by your, by your family uh, to to join the army um, and go down that that line uh, of work. Yeah, I think I definitely got to see, you know, when I was a kid, being in the army was things like going onto the base for um, obstacle course days with another mate, and you had like a an egg in an ammo crate that you couldn't crack to get through the obstacle course, and you were doing things like mill flotation and watercraft and it was a very, you know, you'd block off the street with wheelie bins and play cricket. Um, it was a, it was a fantastic community. And yeah. Particularly then, as I moved out of uh, that, Dad got out of the army when I was in about grade four. When we moved up to Brisbane. Um, I was about what eleven? Was that nine years old? You know, you, you look back on those fond childhood memories and remember that community. And then some of the inspirational people that still remained in my life, some of the children of those other defence families who were a bit older than me became sort of role models and essentially forward scouts. So they got to watch them go. And, and one of those in particular did the officer training and went to the commandos. And I, I basically had these exact role models that I got to follow their career path. So it, it stuck with me early from fun, emotional investment as a kid within that community. And then continued with, you know, particularly your, your impressionable teenage years, watching someone and some people that you look up to do what you want to do. Combined with what I think most guys and girls also go through, you know, Honestly, where I grew up here, I, I hated high school. I didn't have the, the most enjoyable time there. And there's not much opportunity around here apart from the normal cookie cutter style employment. So I definitely was someone who wanted some adventure, wanted some change, wanted to get out of home and do all that. And say RV, that's what the military provides. Yeah. What what year was it when uh, when you were leaving school then? Was it post 9-11? Uh, yeah, 2012. I was talking about 2002. Right. Yeah, and, 2002. Um, so you're right. And what that was, was, uh, what, was, was what was Australia's uh, military footing? Uh, you know, looking like around the, around the globe. You know, as an eighteen year old, what was your understanding of Australia's military? Um, sort of, you know, how many how many fingers did they have in, in pies at that time? Yeah, for sure. I think East Timor had definitely kicked off for us as well. I'd really seen the large military push around. We had the year two thousand Olympic Games here as well, where I got to see you know military uniform and involvement there, and then absolutely the the war on terror. Um, was off and running and the key part was I don't think for me I didn't join up specifically for that you know I you know even throughout all my life I've sort of battled with imposter syndrome and things like that so I definitely wasn't ahead of myself thinking that uh, I was deploying in order I was joining in order to do that I actually joined because I wanted to be a commando Um, that was my primary purpose was to be a commando and it actually came from a place of wanting to test myself to be the best but also just knowing that um, I would finally receive like the highest level of investment and training to either test me to, to become my best or, you know, leave me wanting and leave me with things to, that I needed to improve upon. Yeah. Uh, in terms of uh, East Timor then, what, what is that? What was that conflict look like? And, or what is the, the mission there? Because it's, it's something yeah, that sure. I, I personally don't really know much about. 
no good. So East Timor is now called Timor Leste, but back then it was East Timor uh, was a, uh, a a province uh, of Indonesia that basically wanted to have their own independence and ended up um, being suppressed by the Indonesians um, physically. Um, you know, through use of force and deployed of military forces, a number of massacres occurred, and they actually. Um, voted for and were successful in voting for their independence, um, which then sparked a um, large reaction from Indonesia, including the deployment of military forces against them and, and some more massacres and stuff. And that saw um, Australia intervene. So Australia led the contingent um, into East Timor in, a, in essentially what was a peacemaking phase of operations. And I don't honestly know the years off the top of my head. My military yeah. history for Timor has been overtaken by my military history for uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, so the early years were peacemaking. I know I had one of my cousins and some other friends deploy to that that period, where it was active patrols, restoring security, ensuring that Indonesia was respecting the border and the independence of the country. And then by the time I got over there, it was peacemaking. Um, as you can imagine, as a part of you know regular developing world, developing country um, culture um, and ecosystems, particularly when there was that uh, very hardcore attrition that occurred um, and then the vacuum once that was removed including local gangs and stuff rising up you know that sort of power vacuum where people yeah. start to you know jockey for some positioning and taking out some old grievances so we spent the majority of my time over there conducting weapon sweeps with the united nations to try and recover any remaining remaining things like hand grenades bloody sharpened darts you know bolt action rifles all things that <laughs> shouldn't be on your, your local home block but um it was mainly protecting um, them from each other, protecting weaker from stronger, things like that. Um, but I tell you what, mate, as far as like a, a first deployment as a 22-year-old young platoon commander, and I always had a pretty young platoon, it was fantastic. You know, those those peacekeeping missions were far more um, consuming as far as their emotional intelligence requirements. You know, there wasn't risk, there wasn't threat. Like I said, like even putting your weapon to instant was... <laughs> a big move and a big decision. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I spent, you know, every Thursday, myself and my sig would go down to the local village and teach uh, English to the kids. I'd done, been fortunate enough to learn Indonesian during my three years at the Defence Force Academy, you know, through to you'd go and, you know, we had our own <laughs> platoon fighting chicken that was maintained at the next village <laughs> and go down every week to conduct engagement and watch our poor chook get his head kicked in, but we'd feed him Doxy and Doxy pills and he would recover pretty quick. And, was, he you know, it was, really... was, was he an Australian chicken or was he one that you, you molded nah. from, from the Indonesians? No, we, 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 we sponsored, we sponsored <laughs> this chicken that was maintained by the local stable. Um, but just that integrating with that civilian community, mate, you know, even getting bloody notebooks and crayons and stuff sent over and sitting down with the kids and it, it was fantastic. You yeah. know, I, I joined to be a big tough commando, but I'm my time in Timor was such a pivotal part in my life to appreciate uh, that that true hearts and minds piece, particularly when there's no threat. It was so easy to become jaded by not doing what we'd been trained and developed to do at the pinnacle. But yeah. I was there. I was learning life skills, and I had responsibilities and authorities that were literally helping to shape the lives of you know things like kids and those who literally couldn't provide for themselves. It was you know at 22, it was fantastic, and I got to do it with. 30 guys who were forcing me to be the best I could personally and professionally. So. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting you you, you, you uh, pick up that point of about engaging with locals and trying to help people because I think that generally is, you know, if, if you're infantry, you're, you're the face of the, the army, you're the face of the mission pretty much because you are the one that is yeah. going to be engaging with, you know, people out on patrol day in, day out. And, you know, I think that gets forgotten Um you know, in, in the general overlook of when you look back on conflicts like Afghanistan and Iraq, like almost all of the time is not doing much. You know, it is engaging yeah. with locals and it is like giving fucking kids pens and chocolates and, you know, like teaching them fucking naughty phrases in, in English or whatever like that. But it's like, it's uh, it's the engagement, which is, you know, most of your, most of the time on patrol. And then, you know, every, you know, I, I would say about five, 10 percent of the time, you know, you're, you're engaged in, you know, contact or whatever, or you're, yeah. you know, you're, you know, in a cordon for an ID, but even still then kids are coming up to you where you're sat in a cordon for four hours, like try to fucking steal your, your antenna or whatever it might be. I don't know, but it's like these people have got lasting memories of, of your face and your, your, your time that you spent engaging with them. And, and um, you know, like, like that, I think that gets forgotten because everyone always wants to just hear the fucking 
the the war stories about kicking doors in and you know fucking yeah. getting getting people with a yeah. bayonet or yeah. whatever like that but i mean that's cool that's that's ali but um yeah the the the, the softer side of of war almost kind of gets forgotten a lot absolutely man and only now to doing a lot more and experiencing a lot more and seeing the ramifications of a lot more do I truly appreciate that 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 operational preparation environment actually spans generations and you know we look there to identify and create and foster strong links with those key personnel within the community or within the government or whatever but you know the more of a lasting impact that you actually have an emotional impression on the young generation on those kids you know I openly look forward to and had planned to do um, before COVID got in the way just you know, as a part of my own little sort of self-recovery and discovery over the last year of craziness to get, actually go back to, to Dili uh, in Timor-Leste and actually go back to some of those villages. And, you know, those kids, well, that was 2007, you know, there's 13 years now. Some of those kids are going to be like in their 20s, mate. Yeah. And, um, you know, you, you remember, uh, like I was saying to you beforehand, as far as a lot of the reasons why I joined the military myself, that emotional impression, impressionability as a young one, um, you know, the way in which we conduct ourselves, particularly those little ones, they're the ones who are literally the most vulnerable to be able to either form bad opinions or good opinions. And they do so on an emotive level. Um, yeah. It's the way they feel, not the way they think. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. And the best part about um, most Western countries, don't know about you Scots, but at least for us uh, <laughs> over here, is that most kids like us and we're pretty good engaging with kids. But, oh, no, come you get on, it. You, come know, on. you, you know, you know it's, the it's, Scots are the most liked in the world, right? Oh, is that because the kids run and pull your skirts up, is it? No, I'm, kidding. I'm kidding. Oh, man. I'm kidding, mate. Oh, no doubt. They're probably sitting there trying to understand what you're saying. I, I get it. Yeah. You, you, you'll have that struggle as well with fucking English and American dudes, right? It's oh, like, what the hell are you saying? Like, you talking English? Oh, Don't worry about that. Hell, bro. Um, but, um, so you, you, you joined the army and you ended up um, going down the, the officer, officer route and part of that is going to the, the Royal Military uh, College in Duntroon. So whereabouts is yeah. that? What does it look like? And for oh, good. Yeah, is it essentially like like the like Royal Military Academy Santos? Is it essentially the same thing? For sure. It's taken off. I mean, everything here in Australia is taken off the British model as far as our training and education right. regimes. So our <laughs> Defence Force Academy, where I went for three years, is a mixture. It's a tri-service academy, Army, Air Force and Navy. Um, and that is where you conduct a degree. So it's a university campus, but it's wearing uniforms every day, drill three times a week. And then instead of having university holidays, you conduct um, military training blocks, you go bush. Um, and then if you do three years at ADFA, you only then do one year at the Royal Military College. Uh, if you, or you can go straight into the Royal Military College and not get a degree and do ADFA. And then you have to do 18 months. So they're both located in Canberra and they're both literally over different sides of the hill. Right. So when you graduate from ADFA, you walk, you march over the hill <laughs> to RMC. And the Royal Military College is an all-army academy. And every uh, every person in the military who receives a commission, uh, in the army who receives a commission, goes through the Royal Military College. And you can imagine it's professional military education, it's PT, it's, it's all those good things. Um, yeah. And you go through third, second, and first class and come out um, at the rank of lieutenant. Do you guys call it lieutenant or lieutenant? Uh, well, when you finish Santos, it'll be second lieutenant. Oh, there you go. Yeah, see, we come out as a, a full lieutenant, so two pips. Um, yeah, so second lieutenant over here is two pips, and then lieutenant's one pip, and then captain's three. It's kind of weird. <laughs> wow. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Um, so how, how was your time there? And do you have any highlights that, that you look back on and oh. you know, have some, some fond memories? I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Adver was fun. Adver is what I needed. Um, I was not an exemplary cadet, but I got to, um, I, I did the degree we call Army Rugby Arts. So I did an arts degree. I played lots of rugby and I was good at the Army Bush stuff. But the, and Adver was fun for getting me used to being an adult. And then RMC, the Royal Military College, was fantastic for like getting me into the green because to be honest, like I really didn't enjoy the studying part. Again, getting the language was great. Learning yeah. how to write essays and all that was great. But I was never really that bad at school. I just didn't enjoy it. And then Royal Military College, you finally got to, you know, be tested and trained in leadership. And everything was very tangible and obvious as to what it was required for and its practical application. Uh, you know, we're working towards honing ourselves in, in military craft. And I love that. 
Uh, and there was such a heavy focus on sports and, you know, competitions like obstacle courses. There was a large physical component to it. And I'd always been very um, physically gifted as far as like athletics and rugby and gym and strength and stuff like that. And I was truly tested by others. And it was that, you know, that environment where everyone, yeah. when they had downtime, was going to the gym. And yeah, it was a really, really positive, energizing environment, um, challenging at the same time, lots of new things. And you're being forced to demonstrate leadership and be exposed and have to be you know authentic so I loved it you know and and to this date and throughout my career when the opportunity arose I loved going back to uh, the Royal Military College even last year uh, to conduct uh, you know leadership uh, presentations to them from missions and stuff like that because that is just you know so impressionable but so such a pivotal point in everyone's life you can imagine you're setting the the individual leadership ethos and culture of people from the start. So I have nothing but good memories. However, Canberra, I know I'm saying this to the international Northern Hemisphere audience, is bloody cold. Uh, It is too cold for me. Uh, You know, the first bush trip I went down there at Adfa, I remember eating a beef kai si ming ration pack that made me feel ill and I threw up and in the morning... Uh, I was scraping off a chunk of orange frozen solid kai si ming <laughs> off my, my webbing and snapping it off my hoochie. It was that cold. And I, I don't I don't like the cold, period. So Did you ever um, deploy to Afghan in the winter? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I actually rotated out before winter. On my, uh, I was there for one winter. Yeah. But, mate, like oh. you're doing it with uh, puff jackets and you're doing it. By that time, I was well entrenched in the uh, special forces and my equipment resembled anything but um, tactical over comfort. So, <laughs> uh, and it, when Canberra is not cold, mate, it is so hot uh, during the day and the flies that come out down there, um, you know, Canberra's just... I heard that before. I heard that before. I think it was Rob Langdon. He, he was telling me the same thing about Australia just being fucking covered with flies. Yeah, well, Canberra definitely is. I yeah. mean, look, Canberra is our nation's capital. They carved out of a state and put it the furthest away from. It's the furthest capital city we have away from any actual sea. We're all on the on the coastline. They've got a big bloody lake out there that's probably got too many dead bodies buried in it. I don't <laughs> know, but yeah, it's, Canberra's not for me. It's also like all politicians and all senior military hierarchy. So. All right. Whereas, you know, when I would deploy up to towns, we could go out, get locked up, get in trouble, and all the cops might know you. We do that in Canberra, you're going to be, you know, punching on with the Prime Minister's son or daughter or, you know, something <laughs> terrible that's going to get you on the national news. So you just couldn't step out of line. Yeah. Um, in terms of finishing up at the RMC then, what was your mindset about rocking up to your to your unit as a, as a new, uh, new platoon commander? Uh, well, I was very fortunate you know you really go into competition for which unit you want to go to and that time when you go to select your cores and select your units you know you were sort of selecting what we were guessing was going to be the next next operational cycle and this time we had infantry battalions deploying to uh security detachments in iraq uh also to um, afghanistan in smaller numbers and then to east timor so I definitely want to go up to, I actually thought that two hours was going to be going to Afghanistan first. So I deployed up there and it did, but it was in, in different elements. And the yeah. largest deployment was the, the battle group deployments was to East Timor. So um, that's what ended up. But uh, I always wanted Townsville because I grew up here in Brisbane, which is where most of our other uh, battalions were or the, the ones that were going to be deploying. And I didn't want to be where I'd grown up. I wanted yeah. to, again, that, that complete cutaway. And a lot of anticipation. I mean, up in Townsville, up north is, again, it's light infantry. So there's no vehicles. The vehicles are down here in Brizzy. It's hot. Like, it's tropics. Uh, And, um, again, I I don't want to talk too much in hindsight, noting we're talking about me with anticipation going there. I was fortunate enough to be going there with a couple of guys that I also knew from my class. But, you know, (laughs) there were were definitely nerves. You you don't know what to expect. And that that was the first real big plunge into you know having real live soldiers not leading your fellow classmates and stuff and yeah it was interesting yeah. <laughs> there I, was a, I actually i've never really taken the time to think back over it this is the first time i've really done that in in a long long time yeah. and and uh when you went to the college and were you were you already tracking an infantry route or were you was that something that came later on throughout that time at college 
Uh, so Can when, I I was, when I was 16 years old or 15 years old, I attended my first recruitment seminar in here in Brisbane. And that, and that's, and I knew going in there that I want to be a commando. So I turned up and I said, I want to be a commando. And the guy chuckled, I think it was a corporal on the front. He said, that's <laughs> admirable. There's a few steps in between. <laughs> so that's when he, you know, told me you can go the officer route through ad for, you can go the direct, um, we didn't have direct recruitment. You had to go through regular army. So either way, I knew it was a three to four year yeah. um, cycle, but I knew that at that time commando was a, an infantry core, uh, sorry, an infantry unit in itself. So it was obviously more relevant for me to go the infantry stream. And my, my dad was infantry, my grandfather was infantry. Yeah. Well, my dad started artillery, but was in infantry. So um, that's what I wanted to do. Yeah. And what, what was life? Well, back then, Infantry were the ones who were doing the real work. Yeah, you know what, what was life like as a as a young platoon commander with two RER. Then when you when you eventually did get there and kind of get settled, then was it you know was it a tough job or was it something that you found you know you kind of took to, took in your tracks pretty easy? Uh, it was it was pretty awesome. Like, I was definitely pretty prepared for it, and I think uh, a key part of the benefit with me was actually I still probably doubted myself a little bit internally, not externally. So I definitely took the time to engage with a lot with my platoon sergeant and my section commanders. I had some very experienced dudes. I also had, at that time, uh, Bravo Company actually had a brand new bunch of um, new soldiers come in. So um, most of where you might encounter, you know, angry NCOs um, dealing with the, the young Jube officer, a lot of their time was spent being angry with the young Jube soldiers. <laughs> <laughs> so I sort of got to as long as I was doing my job pretty well I got to learn pretty fast and my, my key my key strength in, in anything to do with militaries I'm, I'm, I'm any of these days I'm a very fast learner um, and so I'm able to really get in there and just shut up for the first few weeks and, and sit there and watch and you can imagine marching into a new unit there's enough stuff you have to do yourself to get yeah. yourself sorted and as long as you're keeping your eyes and your ears open along the way and it was just you know really organically growing with that and to be honest, mate, the worst part about actually joining the battalion as a new platoon commander was actually the other more senior junior officers. Like there was back in those days, there was this this culture whereby, you know, there were there were bullies, mate. There were genuine oh, really? bullies from these older dudes who were like the senior lieutenants and not so much the camp and the captains, it was in the, the lieutenant ranks who were, you know, two, three years ahead of you. Uh, and I don't know if they had a chip in their shoulder. You know, I've run into a few of them since then and I just couldn't really care about it. But there was definitely a this look to establish this own internal hierarchy. And, you know, there was a similar back at the Royal Military College and Defence Force Academy with the hierarchy being your years. But for me, I was always really so adamant that, you know, your competence and character, your performance and your personality were those key definitions. And, you know, there's definitely a, a level of respect you have to afford to people who are senior to you in, in time and, and position. But I'm sure as all of us these days who've actually served the military know that just because you've been somewhere for longer doesn't mean you're better at it. Yeah. You know, it yeah, might mean that it not. takes longer to do that, mate, you know. <laughs> and and the, to going into an attitude of entitlement, given anything other than daily renewable performance, is already a character trait and a leadership quality that I can and, and never will uh, connect with and I see that as someone being a bully and the best part about my entire defense career in hindsight was my ability to travel around the world and take the fights to bullies and support those who were being bullied so I actually really hated that first year in the battalion as a young officer because of some of the other officers who were just bullies and to be honest as opposed to actually getting in fights with a few of them which there were some argy bargy I just actually disengaged from that and I just engaged so much more with my platoon, my guys, and I, I actually started playing, you know, rugby outside of the base in my civvy guys. And then when some of those other guys moved on in the subsequent years, um, I took it upon myself to make sure that the next um, lieutenants, the next young officers coming through never had that happen to them. And that, you know, my last year, third year as um, a lieutenant, I became senior subaltern, um, the senior subby, which is this sort of unofficial official position. Yeah. Uh, and then finally I got to achieve my sort of cultural takeover and that never happened again from that point forward. But also, you know, army culture shifted, but it was a really, really key lesson to learn from that that really early age. Eh? Happens in the officer ranks too, mate, you know, yeah. not just you Listen, bloody. I, I was just about to say it's fucking, it's so, it's so weird, but I don't know if that's a, a more societal thing. Does Australia have like a, like a, 
like a recognised kind of class structure? Because obviously in the UK, that's a thing, right? You know, you've got people who, uh, in, who yeah. inherit land and inherit property and, you know, they've, they're fucking born and bred with a silver spoon in their mouth. And I'm not saying that officers are that like that in the UK, but, you know, there's definitely the, the fucking, the, the poorer class of society that end up joining infantry. And that's just general across the board. That's just a fact. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't rich. My, my, my old boy was in the army and then I fucking... Uh, I ended up leaning on my mum for, you know, and it was just me and her for a while and she wasn't doing too great, you know, looking back on it now. So, like, I never had privilege. And I think the guys who are, who are coming through and who might have that, you know, that bully mentality, you know, they, they've just got away with it all their life. But, you know, they've just had mm. that ability just to fucking press and press and press on people who they deem or, you know, you know, inadequate to them or... And you know what it is, and, and I've came to realise it, is, is incompetence. They hide their incompetence and they hide their uh, incapability to, to actually lead and actually have an understanding of what it does take to, to lead, you know, men. Yep. And, and you're told, you know, as you go through the ranks, you're, you're told, like, especially the first rank as, a, as an NCO, you're told, oh, you need to separate yourself from the guys. And so, like, that becomes a focus for young NCOs, like, separating themselves rather than actually being a good leader. Like oh I'm not going to drink with the boys in the lines anymore. Um, I'm going to I'm going to make sure I'm, I'm being a cunt to them. And it only takes a couple of years for you. It, it it takes a while for you to realize that that that's not how it, how it works. Like you actually, the more investment you put into the, into the boys, the more you drink in the lines with them, the more they'll respect you. The more they'll understand that you're a fucking actually a good you know a good leader. Uh, but you yeah. have to be a good leader at the same time. You can't just be bevying with them all the time or whatever. But do you think that's maybe the same case as? you know, for, um, for the situation you're describing. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I 100% level with you and I put it down to weak leadership. You know, the one thing that I am an expert is in, is, is leadership and planning only because that's all I was ever taught at every rank level and progression and then yeah. had to master and teach to others. And being a leader is comprised of three things. It's authority, you know, the rank given to you, um, management, your ability to effectively manage resources and, and leadership, your ability to motivate people. So the weakest form of leaders are those who rely on authority or perceptions of authority and wield it as entitlement as opposed to responsibility. Um, and in this case, you know, they actually didn't have authority. It was perceived authority that came from time and rank or seniority in years as opposed to competence. Um, and dovetailing into what you were talking about as far as like delineation of classes in Australia, probably not so much. I mean, looking back, I think I remember a few of those guys were you know, private school boys and my mum was an aerobics instructor and my dad was again worked his way from a, a soldier and went to officer training but there was never really any of that there was more so um you know just pretty much because i've been there long enough this is what i believe and it's very interesting to note also your point talking about maintaining that separation from the guys um i i'm a guy who um, and it also even comes from, you know, I wasn't a popular kid in bloody high school. I was overweight. I was like obese and like the fat kid at school. And I really never had friends. And that was probably one of the best part about the army was that, you know, I was forced to be around people and people were forced to be in my team. But I was a big, um, I, was I, a also, big, I was a big fatty too at one point when I was a kid. Um, <laughs> mate, the, the best ones are, you know, 72 <laughs> hours on the man. That's where it's at. Um, I, I had to maintain and keep maintain those barriers in order to, because I, I definitely um, sometimes I'm definitely all in, particularly when I like someone um, and not like someone out of favoritism. But, you know, I really take a liking to someone when you just see that they are a tireless, a hard worker. They are the silent achiever and they are bubbling with potential. Um, and also, you know, I was always very physically gifted as far as like being captain of the football team or, or what, like, you know, just very good in physical competitions and things. And you can imagine in the infantry, that is that you people start really magnetizing to you and you start hanging out with those guys at the gym and things like that. And I had to maintain buffers whereby I didn't go out and interact on the piss with the guys and things like that, only because I didn't yet have that emotional maturity to be able to cut off um, that emotion or that fondness in that and maintain that professional relationship afterwards, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know, I could sort of unfortunately wear my heart a little bit too much on my sleeve. And I even look back and remember being, you know, in the platoon office with some of the guys talking about one of the other platoon commanders and, you know, what do I think about this? And, you know, even saying like, Hey guys, I think it's inappropriate to be having this conversation. And fast forward, you know, there's been plenty of nights where I've had some of my guys in a headlock. They've had me in a headlock, um, you know, and particularly once 
we get into the much more kinetic years of my military career and, you know, getting on the piss with your guys is actually a, a very intelligent decompression hyperdose of depressant, which is alcohol in extremely anxious circumstances that are re repetitious combat deployments. Um, and there's actually that making yourself relatable and real to the guys being vulnerable, not being weak with the yeah. guys. And that's all part of our own personal emotional maturity and develop that we, and it is it, it, particularly for young officers who haven't had life experience before service, there is that requirement to maintain separation. But the key part is it's not to maintain status or it's not to maintain authority. It's to maintain effectiveness and maintain a clear sight of leadership versus likability. But as my career culminated, I'm now out of the military, the best leaders are those that are liked and not liked because they're good guys, but because they're good guys and they're good at their job. And you know that they will be better at their job as being good guys. And they appreciate that, that piece. And that's actually the hardest form of leadership, the, the weakest and easy form of leadership to, to solely rely on your authority or just to be friends with the guys but being able to balance the two of them, appreciate we're all emotionally regulated and actually tap into and harness those emotions and show your own in a controlled fashion that we call passion. Yeah. Um, that's that's a much harder form of leadership and it really takes a very special type of person to, to learn and develop that through a trial and error. Well, yeah, I mean, I totally agree with everything you just said there. Um, one of the most like um better mate you better otherwise we're going to edit this out of the podcast right <laughs> yeah I, I, I definitely don't want this to be an echo chamber but i i do agree with everything you just said there i i almost fucking we're, we're all very similar minded so we, we all fucking have the same thoughts um most likely yep. but um yep. you know one of the good one one of good the good ones the bad ones are just caught up in their own shit yeah one of the uh one of the most um you know public displays of like a leadership you know type bonding uh event would be like a like our international rugby team getting together you know i don't think it happens so much nowadays but you know back in the day like they would have like a friendly and then they'd go out and piss or they'd have like a big piss up to start off like a training camp and then they'd, you yeah. know you know it's just to, it's just to set the mood set the scene get everyone you know um tracking about how this guy is how they socially interact with each other and how much they're actually willing to to invest in you know the guys that they might not have you know met before or whatever you know uh and that's one of the most public displays of like a like a, a bonding event yeah, you get because every, they all talk about it they all they all openly discuss like uh going on tour and you know how how bonded they up they were when they came back from that and it's the same as us you know when you when you go on deployment it's the same you know you come back and you're like the fucking boys you've just been on tour with is closer to you than like your own family but obviously we're not getting big piss up sessions on out in afghan well I don't know about you, but we weren't. Um, but yeah, it's like it's those times yeah. spent together, and you, like you mentioned as well, you become vulnerable with guys, and and they see that you are actually a person that you, they can they can invest in you rather than just you know taking what you're saying as a leader or an authoritarian and just doing the doing the job. You know, as a bare minimum, they're they're more likely to invest more of their effort and time into trying to impress you and trying to produce the goods for you rather than just doing it because you told them to. Yeah, absolutely. It's that it's that emotional alignment to purpose yeah. um, and to, to mission. And you know, even getting on the piss. You know, we talk about Dutch courage. You know, and there were those who who use getting on the piss as their opportunity to to do crazy shit. But more so, it actually helps us to wear down and remove some of those layers that actually prevent us from showing some of that true emotion. And yeah. some of that emotion is that bromance, love, that mateship we talk about here in Australia, mate. And you know, sometimes you just need those sessions to to connect and engage. And it's just knowing when to draw the line is that hard thing. And, you know, I'll level with you. When we were on deployment to Afghanistan within special forces, we did have controlled drinking sessions, um, you know, as a part of it, you know, once a month um, with the the Bravos, the platoon sergeants and the CSM would conduct like a lockdown of the lines and you'd have designated servers. And it was, mate, it was more coordinated than any bloody professionally licensed <laughs> nightclub as far as the control measures and weapons locked away and all that sort of good stuff. But, you know, when we lost a guy or when we lost guys over there, um, you know, we, we would do it. And it's looking back in hindsight, it's again, when you're on operational deployments uh, and you're going outside the wire, we went outside the wire, the equivalent of every second day on our five month deployment. So 67 missions. And this was flying out to capture and kill people. It wasn't going on presence patrols. It was going into the thick of it. Guys who quantified to have special forces sent after them. 
you know, and we lost one of my guys to an IED and he was our very best engineer, Jedi, special forces guys we'd ever met. And if, you know, the most dangerous unseen risk could get him, you know, we're living with those risks every day. And you're just building and feeding into this lifestyle of anticipation and potential fear. And it's more so that anxiety you're literally building a lifestyle of anxiety. And as we all know, alcohol, mate, is a, is a, is a depressant. Yeah. Um, let alone the ability to have a, a supercharged boost of a depressant to help knock out some of that anxiety and then to lower some of those potential barriers to allow you to actually express emotions that otherwise you're suppressing because you need to maintain your physical and mental resilience and, and alertness out there. Um, <laughs> when I speak to my grandfather, he told me the same thing about his time in Vietnam and Korea and, you know what, I say this to any of my officer mates or any of those generals who are like, you know, the men shouldn't be drinking, it's a dry trip. The men should not be left to be drinking under their own provisions. Yeah. But if you do not appreciate that, like every other Western society does, the potential role that being able to allow people to feel um, some form of um, vulnerability, be that, you know, consuming alcohol with their guys in a controlled fashion, then you're irrelevant. And you're just a bloody, as Alan Jones, one of our famous TV presenters here says, you're just a bloody start shirt sitting in an office. You need to get out there on the <laughs> ground and get some relevance. And that's the issue for some of those people who have just become professional officers. And I say professional officers, and there's even professional senior NCOs and warrant officers, um, as opposed to leaders, you know, you need to maintain your relevance to the ground. And that's just one very small single issue zealot topic I'm going to talk about. But, you know, particularly with this podcast being for those guys in the you know, you know, if you sign up to, to work through it and suck it up and go through the shit. Um, there are small little things that are actually beneficial and supportive to you. And as long as they're conducted with responsibility and entitlement per anything in our careers, they actually have the ability to be force multipliers and preserve the force yeah. as opposed to fracturing it. Yeah. Um, sort of risk reward you you risk your lives for three weeks you get a little fucking two two can rule uh <laughs> every friday or something like that um but well, what, I, can't, I can't play hard but do so in moderation yeah exactly what yeah. was the uh what was the difference in culture then when you eventually got to two commando um well, and and you st you kind of you go back to that platoon commander role don't you yeah so i went um two commander that time was a six-week selection course i went from you guys deal in kilos, yeah, not pounds? Uh, yeah, kilos, yeah. <laughs> I went from like, uh, what, 94 kilos down to 78 kilos on my selection course. Uh, you know, then it's the rest of that year is spent on your reinforcement cycle doing all the qualification courses. And, you know, it's like it is hardcore professional investment in you. You know, every single type of weapon suite, every single type of insertion method from parachuting to fast roping to rappelling to watercraft you know, the, the close quarter battle piece, um, the, the shooting skill sets, you know, shooting until your finger bloody hurts and, you know, just the, the repetition and con constant mission profile. So that's where you're just like, right, I now get why special forces are so hard. Unfortunately, there's no magic pill or no magic piece of equipment. It's bloody hard work. But the resources, you know, we had helicopters. We had more ammunition than we could fire. There wasn't the usual piss ass fanning around with like you know little admin stuff you know there were teams doing that admin stuff for you the equipment you were issued was the state-of-the-art equipment and if it wasn't good enough you go back and get new stuff um so the, the biggest uh cultural change and philosophical and psychological change came down to this the the mindset of the unit and the mindset of the capability was operationally focused um and any questions that came down to opinions or i don't want to do this or whatever we're so easily cut through from the support staff level to the operator level in like, why are we doing this? What is our purpose? And that even followed through to, you know, we were called up to do a number of other short notice missions in other parts of the world um, and also within our own country. And the ability to all of a sudden have, you know, a, a C-17 on the strip and have vehicles bombed up ready to go and then have, you know, requests for approvals in with government and, you know, just proper real world cutting through red tape shit um let alone then when you're deployed on operations and the exact same thing yeah. it was just it really set me up for absolute failure in the civilian world <laughs> thinking that people could be easily aligned and focused on purpose and cut through all these things you i went you know the mentality in there was why not or can do you know we can do this why not why can't we do this and if no one gave me a good answer then we're going to do it and that it came with an immense responsibility for 
constantly, you know, as an officer level, constantly providing briefs, um, risk mitigations, you know, having to take people, be those your, your senior hierarchy, foreign diplomats, whatever, on the journey with you to appreciate where you're at at the intuitive level and, and dict and um, narrate it for them at, a, at an operational and strategic level. But it was just, it, it was so much clearer. There was so much less uncertainty in the day-to-day operations and strategy and logic and philosophy and mindset around it. There was a lot of uncertainty in what we were going to do. Um, but, you know, no mountain was too high to climb and it was, it, it was intoxicating. Yeah. It was absolutely intoxicating to go from a level of performance whereby I say this to people, by the time I deployed with my platoon towards the end of 2012 to Afghanistan, we were already at like a level of team cohesion. You know, we talk about like ESP sort of level stuff from even the, the planning team that was my myself with my sergeants. You know, I had most of my team commanders were sergeants um, through to some absolutely gun um, junior NCOs as well. Uh, my job was to, you know, corral the team, manage them, steer the rudder of their ship and then make the end state decisions. But at the same time, you know, someone's already looking out for you if the boss has got a feed or, you know, is taking you to the gym to help you with your time management because I'm just in there planning all day. Yeah. True to out on the ground, you know, turning, something kicks off on the right-hand side and before you even have to turn, you guys are dealing with it and then you're helping just get them assets over there and force multiplying to it. I had this philosophy. I'd always rather rain in a stay and the kick a mule. And it was so incredible just being pulled along um, and, and riding along with a, a group of stallions um, and just having the requirement to finesse and refine them and, and just put that combat power and effort and energy into achieving some incredible results, you know, and results that you're never going to be able to match. <laughs> That's a good statement. I've not, I've not heard that one before. I'd rather rain in a stay than kick a mule. I've got, there's a similar, yeah, th- there's a similar one I, I like to, to use as a uh, ships are safest in the harbor, but that's not what they're made for. <laughs> it's kind, of, kind of the same. Oh, that's of, a good one. Kind of that applies to that applies to many sort of, of the strategic decision conversations we're having at the moment. Um, <clears throat> but so, you know that was also particularly within Australian culture, and a lot of this is coming out with our Afghan issues and inquiry at the moment, where our special forces were really at that time, the only true force elements that were truly trusted and enabled to do their job. And it does come from purely, like you were saying, a risk mitigation measure. You know, we were employed to do things back at home and even overseas that uh, were were roles for the infantry, mate. You know, I did a three-day clearance of the Kajaki fan with a troop of Abrams tanks attached to me um, from the US Marine Corps during my deployment in 2012. You know, I was doing fire movement with tanks. Like, that is un-SF as fuck you know, the giant bullet magnets. I was saying we should be, you know, using the tanks as a distraction each night, hopping on helos and, you know, coming in behind them and doing all this sort of shit. But the US commander of that um, regional area was unwilling to send any force in there less than a brigade size unless it was the commando company with his tanks going in there, you know. Yeah, the standard it's, standard it's, US uh, sort of um, uh, ops, isn't it? You know, sending fucking... I remember one of my mates was a, a he's a Royal Marine and he went and done an exercise with the US Marines out in Nevada, which is obviously epic. And they got a piss up in the Las Vegas as a, as like an R and R at the end. Um, yeah. But he was saying that like they were going down, you know, a live fire range and it was you know platoon size, platoon size live fire range, and you know they they'd fucking swept up in a matter of a couple of hours or whatever. And then he said that the US Marines came afterwards and they just had Humvees and fucking they had like Apaches and like a company size worth of guys and it took them twice as long. And I was like, what the fuck? Like, I, I, like I'd never experienced it like that. Um, I'd worked with a few, a few Americans as attached, but never with like an actual force. Um, so I, I, yeah. I, I hadn't really experienced the, how they do, you know, how they operate on the ground in terms of their, you know, um, operational tactics or, or anything like that. But he was telling me, he's like, bro, you would never fucking believe it. They just essentially just got an extended line and just marched forward. I said, like, Jesus Christ, you know, we've got such a such a capability in, in terms of our tactics on the ground in the UK from from how I from a, how I, you know, understand it as a as a search commander, you know, like like you mentioned earlier, you're yeah. an, uh, an SME in leadership. I'm I'm a, an SME in infantry tactics because that's what I've done them, you know, search commander's battle course and platoon sergeant's battle course. It's like that's all you know. Um, yep. so when I hear someone tell me they just get an extended line and fucking march forward with all these assets it's like Jesus Christ 
like that's just not the way it's done anymore yeah well, it's just yeah different tactics you know the, even between the u.s i've spent a lot of time working with the u.s units and um it's even because they're so huge you can definitely see such just differences in the individual formations even individual formations within formations within formations and you're right there is a huge reliance on assets provided to them but that comes from a place of always having <laughs> assets with them whereas you know countries like yours and mine are always rely on other people's assets so a lot more of our investment be that in resources in time and particularly in money goes into that individual level training um you know if you don't have that and as you know that's the hardest level of training is actually in the individual person because the individual person has to then decide to do those actions whereas technology and systems you know do those by design so it's very interesting seeing you know where you have the resources to do this and you you don't have to spend as much time in this because you can actually achieve the same outcome yeah. whereas over here you don't have this then you need to put more in down here in order to bring things up yeah, so exactly. yeah it's different horses for courses but i've definitely and as you know yourself mate that's the best part about the infantry and particularly these days where our roles just keep chopping and changing left right and center it, it all comes down to what the task is and that's where we always need to make sure that we maintain our ourselves in our own mindsets um to be able to adapt to that um and make sure we are relevant and applicable as opposed to redundant and set in our ways yeah and you you deployed you, you, that first deployment was it was as a commando platoon commander right the first deployment to afghanistan i was actually the personal security officer for our prime minister julia gillard and oh, i was right. just a couple of weeks Damn. over there mate it was how was that random man? <clears throat> well it was very random for me it's like you know first ever trip to afghanistan and now psd protected security detachments is usually commanded by um a captain or a senior nco and i was I was I was a very capable um I was very capable of my individual skills as a officer as well again I was much younger and I always you know came from quite a uh, physicality in my skill set so I was actually like a very good shot very good at most of those close quarter battle um and close quarter shooting type stuff so uh, I could actually match it with a lot of the other guys who were trying to go in for it but particularly for with the prime minister you can imagine there was a lot of other security clearances required for a lot of the meetings she was going into yeah and it always behoved us on the tactical level to have someone in there to admittedly feed back to our unit but also be there to support <laughs> her mate and that's from like a real-time risk perspective so yeah i was i was hers and that was uh yeah that was literally my first trip to afghanistan you know looking back from the perspective of being there four times then i'm by the the second, third, fourth time, you 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 know, but particularly by the third, fourth time, you're like, hurry up! No, that's not it. That's the bird I need to get on. This is where I am. You know, you, you, the the level of comfort is like you're just visiting a mate's place or flying to the states. Whereas the first time, you're like, and we're staging in Dubai in the UAE. Yeah, like, I was just oh, going to say, God. like, what the hell was it like being a fly on the wall, tra like traveling around with the prime minister? It must have been fucking crazy. It was because the whole time, you know, I'm like, holy shit, I'm looking up to the Prime Minister. <laughs> of course, it's our first ever female Prime Minister. Well done, Heston. Um, and she, to be honest, mate, she was fantastic. You know, behind closed doors, she was absolutely fantastic. And it was great to see and very enlightening to see the difference between politics in front of the camera and the person and actual leadership potential behind the camera that was never allowed to be realized because politicians first purpose is to their party not to the Australian people yeah. it was really fascinating to see that but at the same time mate you know I'm trying to focus on this then I'm also knowing that the next year I was going to be deployed over there as a platoon commander on a combat rotation trying to also soak everything in and you know, <laughs> speak to as many guys and it was it was yeah I probably wouldn't have preferred to have done that again I definitely would have preferred to have gone over there first but you know I'm never going to look a gift horse in the mouth like that again yeah um, and it was a it's a great story anyway that's for sure yeah 100 percent. and and were you when when you went over was it just uh you know working in kabul with, with her or were you doing trips out to see boys and fobs or whatever yeah so we uh first things first we actually flew into tarrant count which is where the australians were based um and then did a meeting with all the conventional forces down there and then took her up to the special operations task group and then it was into kabul um and did everything who met and worked with the u.s four star who was heading up um the isaf yeah uh, no heading up the nato forces um you know and she was fantastic she was at that point in time 2012 or 2011 we were already talking about the drawdown of troops and she went straight in there saying you know these are the these are the lines of whichever tier of isr we need in order to maintain operations and this is what we need from support assets and this is what we need 
I was like, holy cow, she's speaking green. It was good to go. Yeah. Yeah. And then we had a one-on-one meeting with then President Karzai. And that was very different. I had to go in there and uh, do a recce and actually meet with his security force with another one of my guys. And there was a lot of posturing and positioning and, you know, they didn't want me to bring a weapon in. And it was was uh, very, very intriguing. It was pretty cool. Huh. Did Karzai have uh, Delta operators at, at that time as his security? No, no, he didn't. He had. Um, he eventually uh, did get them, didn't he? Or was that previous? I don't know, mate. Yeah, when I when I was there, all I remember dealing with is, um, yeah, suited up security force who were um, definitely locals. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot, in those places in those situations. There's a lot going on behind closed doors, and it was very very interesting. Yeah. Uh, you know, the whole time everyone's trying to get more information out of you than you're willing to tell. And it it was fun. No, as far as, you know, like, again, learning some of those great skills that set you up to, for, uh, for interesting question time at the pub with a local later on down the track in your life. It was, it's fun having those real life, um, yeah, training sessions, I call them, uh, engaging with people pretending that they don't speak English and (laughs) yeah, exactly. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, it was good. Um, in terms of Afghanistan in general, then, like you, you mentioned that you were back and forward there a bunch of times. What was uh, what was what was your best deployment that you you look back on with, with with your fondest memories, or maybe not even your fondest memories, but just as like um, one that's at the forefront of your mind? Yeah, so my my deployment uh, to Special Operations Task Group Rotation eighteen, so that was middle to the end of two thousand twelve. Um, was hands down, you know, the, the highlight of my career whereby, you know, we talk about everything from finally being tested in the absolute art and craft of what we've been trained to do through to leading and in being inspired by the soldiers that I was responsible for leading over there on missions against enemy who, um, you know, we had the authority to kill or capture because they had previously engaged with terrorist activities, killed civilians, detonated suicide IEDs through to um, one of the most, you know, um, incredible and um, traumatic experiences like losing one of my absolute best guys, you know, to an IED in one of the most, you know, horrific ways that no one should ever have to see. Um, and then you know, for the unique circumstance to me, and this is probably the, the, that mission in particular where I lost Scott is probably one of the most terrible and tremendous for the simple fact that it was so terrible the way in which we lost Scott and the fact that we lost Scott. Um, uh, it happened on day one of a three-day clearance uh, and just for like perspective even in the Australian deployments to Afghanistan usually within at least 24 hours that call sign was then back out of um, the field and sort of dealing with what they needed to whereas we were back out there still for another 48 hours another two days and this is one of the key stories that I used to go back to our Royal Military College and tell the guys about uh, lessons in leadership whereby um, I not only had to refocus, recalibrate and even change of task and, and redirection of the guys on the ground to then continue on and achieve our mission after losing Scott. You know, we're talking after three hours worth of um, collecting as much of Scott as we could um, under fire and reconstituting the platoon and refocusing everyone in a period whereby we, for the first time, had lost one of our own, again, in a terrible way. And you can imagine all the emotions going through us. Through to having to do that on a personal level, before asking my guys to do that and then having to command lead um, and manage them through that um, for the rest of the period to prosecute targets and to do so in a way that will not only keep Scott proud but would keep us together and make sure that we um, maintained our fighting capability for that mission and for the rest of the missions that we still have to do because we still had plenty of time in Afghanistan so a lot of these conversations in our Australian media at the moment talk about like this warrior culture and um, the pros and cons. And my key statement is that uh, war has the ability to war by extreme nature, you know, is hard to comprehend and hard to understand. And unless you've been there yourself and war really tests people down to that, you know, mortal fight, every mortal fiber that they potentially have that really tests their personal morals, their personal ethos and, the best part about everything I experienced over there was I saw war turn people into the greatest version of themselves, whereby they truly were selfless. They did not care for their own lives. And I don't say that in any form of callous or irresponsible way. 
they just so wholeheartedly cared for the people they were there working with and fighting with and fighting for and the cause and the mission and the people back home that they were doing so for as well. Um, so much so that they did not fear for their own safety and they did, they weren't ever held back from doing what needed to be done. And then in doing so with that absolutely incredible situation, there's also the belief for it to corrupt people and some people, you know, without supervision um, have probably done things that they shouldn't have done. And even at a, at a personal emotional level without even acting out physically, you know, I definitely felt some levels of that corruption. You know, I remember after losing Scott wanting to go and find the nearest um, insurgent. And even if he'd thrown down his weapon, I was going to do something to him and take his life in return. And that never came along, but I still remember and I still carry that and now sort of appreciate that, you know, even though that's not in the heat of battle, like that's that fog of war that creeps in. Yeah to us and particularly when we're fighting counterinsurgencies and particularly when there is no real threat but there always is a threat be that under the ground be that an insider attack be that the next mission you know i could happily live mate with losing my own life in combat i could happily live with myself getting injured um when i lost one of my guys you know it, it starts to tear a little bit at you know if you were you doing your job good enough but then you know i knew we were and I knew the team we had there and I didn't have time to focus on that. But um, then we yeah, when you're presented with those circumstances time and time and time again, and those same threats time and time and time again, that's really where you start to recognize that one, how truly exceptional those people are around you and the way that they can just conduct themselves and crack on through it. But secondly, that there is always that potential for it to just finally chip away at people and for, for things potentially occur either there on the ground or later down the track and, um, it's also very hard to recover from essentially that greatness. It's hard to recover from literally becoming the truly, truly best version of yourself through circumstances that are never going to be replicated in everyday life unless you live in some pretty bad suburbs of Dublin or something. I don't know. But, um, yeah, and there's, to be honest, mate, the hardest part about all of this, I know I'm jumping ahead of myself here, is actually – living with never being that great again and living with never having that responsibility and never, living with never having that team again. Um, Cause by the time we finished that deployment at the end of 2012, we were at just such a fine tune level, mate, that you could have asked us to, you know, go to hell and back and we would. Yeah. Um, and this was the first true emotional trauma um, I suffered professionally Um outside of the loss of Scott, sorry, I mean, more so I mean in career wise was at the end of 2012, I had to move on from being a platoon commander and become like the company XO. Oh, and mate, I wrote letters to the CEO. <laughs> I, I went out kicking and screaming. It hurt. Um, <laughs> and it was such a, an interesting part for me to, to realize and to answer your question, you know, my deployment in Afghan 2012 was the greatest um, I have ever been personally um, because I was responsible for guys and I was in the conditions that were, you know, life and death and all that good stuff and responsible for Australian strategic interests and all that good stuff. I've then gone on to, you know, be more impressed with my performance professionally in a career sense, but as far as being directly responsible for people who I was never more proud to be responsible for, um, that was my greatest there and then in um, the second half of 2012. Yeah, it's, um, you know, it that that phrase you said earlier on about never being as as great again or never being as cool again that i have the exact same thing from 2009 i was 18 years old and like looking back Oof. now looking back now it's like i will never be as cool as i was when i was fucking 18 like and as a as a grown adult it's like fuck like what like what's the point anymore <laughs> oh you're 29 years old 30 are you 30 yeah spring chicken Please, um all right um, on, yeah. but it's like it's it's just fucking it's it's just looking back on those those times and those deployments and and the the reason why it was like it was like that is because you're all in such a harsh extreme environment together that you're you're completely at one with what you've got to do like you mentioned earlier on you you know you you'd be more than happy to lose your own life but losing the life of someone else is like it's, it's traumatic and you know we lost a bunch of guys in that deployment, but I was lucky enough to actually not know any of them. So I never really had to, you know, process it like that. It was just literally FNG straight from basic training. Um, yeah. And, you know, dealing with that for, for the guys who, who were in a leadership position at that time, at, at that time, platoon sergeants and platoon commanders and OCs, it, it must be fucking horrendous. Um, yeah. 
you know, I, 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 you know, I don't know how I would have dealt with it had I been in a position like that. I think the the key part, and you touched on it beforehand. I, yeah, like I said before about the be more than willing to losing yourself or losing someone else, but it's also like the people. It's very hard, like explaining that to you know everyday civilians these days. It almost sounds like too romantic and too much of a movie, but like it really is. You know, tell them that I was never once fearful going in on all those terrible bumpy landings we had helicopters yet i'll get on a flight from sydney to brisbane hit turbulence and be praying to god 14 <laughs> times before i hit the ground like you know it's just so different but also you knew because we were at that intuitive level and that just assumed level of mateship and cohesion with each other we the we knew each other also thought that same way so you know feeling sad for this person that died was always going to happen but you knew that they were having those same feelings that, that they would have preferred to have died before you. So particularly as a commander, my platoon sergeant at the time was actually one of the best ones to have this sort of conversation with me. Um, I was, I was always very good at compartmentalizing my emotions. You know, when I got back from that um, three day mission, you know, I got the platoon phone and I called my mom and I cried like a baby um, because uh, you know, I'd actually met Scott's um friends i met his partner before we deployed i hadn't met his mum yet at that time and that's where the head goes to is like their loss yeah it's mm-hmm. about the other's loss of him not so much the loss of his life i definitely missed his loss within us but you know there was it's a part of that warrior culture whereby um, it's not quite the valhalla celebration type thing but you know that it's terrible that they're gone but so inspiring that they went doing what they loved for those that they truly loved in those moments. So, yeah. So I never, I never really got taken over by grief um, in those situations and even going out on those missions and then cracking on and putting us and our guys and myself in risk. You never, as long as you knew why you were doing it, you know, and that you had planned your ass off and you, you know, you were confident in your skill sets and you'd done all your mission rehearsals and preparations. Um, you know, there was never a time I, I stepped out thinking that we were ill-prepared or we didn't have the skill sets to do what we needed to do. And as terrible it sounds, like sometimes shit happens. Yeah. And if shit happens, you know, we will know that we will have gone down doing to the very best of our ability and doing what we wanted to do. We didn't want to be anywhere else in the world but out there doing that. And we knew that that came with risks. And yeah, the worst thing you could have done is deny us from doing that. So it was actually very easy carrying forward knowing that everyone was in that mindset it really removed a lot of that emotion of like, we're well, being worried about losing each other. As long as you weren't reckless. And as long as I did my job and everyone did their job, um, it was actually like really, really comforting knowing that you weren't with a group of people who are worried about their own survival. They were more focused on getting shit done. Yeah. It's uh, that what you said there about, um, about the, the, the boys not wanting to be anywhere else. Like they would literally rather be doing nothing else with their life. Uh, and the, the reason is, 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 you know, you're fucking taking bad guys off the planet. You're, you're doing a good for, for the world and for society in general. And, you know, if you, you take the fight to, to bad guys in their ground, then you, you, you mitigate the risk of them coming to your homeland and, you know, having a, a, an impact on your family potentially. Um, and one of yeah. my biggest regrets is something that I had no control over whatsoever. Um, but, you know, you look back in hindsight is, you know, as a regret almost, is not having involvement with the... Uh, you know, we're dealing with ISIS and Daesh or whatever. You know, the UK done you know very little uh, in terms of contributing to that. I know they had a, a SF units out there nonstop, um, but you know, you look back and you think Afghanistan, Iraq, where where could we really have made a big difference? And it definitely would have been fighting fighting ISIS. But at the same time, it's like you know how how many of these these areas are, are you willing to go to because you know there's boko haram in africa are you willing to you know send battalions and brigades and divisions to to, to that uh, conflict as well and then you know you could go all over you could literally it's, it's completely endless the amount of conflict there is in the world but i think for me like you know that um that involvement with isis that i never got the opportunity to to take on is is a regret and like i said it's nothing that i had any control over whatsoever but you know, I'd have fucking loved to wipe some of those boys out. <laughs> no, it's so it is so interesting, mate. And I'm I'm with you. I was chomping at the bit to get over there because let's just talk it as far as like a physical manifestation of the Mondo definition of evil, you know, by, by Western standards, by what we saw over there and what we saw was occurring from, you know, 
what we saw them doing to those they captured through to those locals. You know, there's just there's unequivocal. Um, you know, that is that is that is evil that needs yeah. to be eradicated from the earth. And what that was truly like from me actually going over there and you know, our commander, you know, um, partnered a lot with the um, counter terror. What are they called? Bloody CTC? No. The Iraqi Special Counterterrorist Unit, Counterterrorist Police Unit. Um, bloody hell, yeah. I've been out of it too long. Sorry, mate. Is that the uh, just in, the guys that drive a boat in the black comers and they're all dressed up? Yes. Black? Yeah. Yeah, like mate, watching them just be so inspired, and you know they were the, they were the best fighters, and they were. It was very inspirational seeing these people like taking up the mission to defend and take over, take back their homeland personally. You yeah. know and. I never got to go out there on the ground with the guys. You know, I was I was admittedly at that time dealing with synergies between Iraq and Syria and, you know, Peshmerga and future weapons arms procurement for the Iraqi forces. It was very cool doing that big boy stuff. But when I did get to go down and engage with and actually to see, you know, at that time there were bloody drones watching everything ridiculous and then going and engaging with my former commando guys who were the team commanders on the ground with them and, you know, just that that level of fighting it was it was it was very interesting to see just the level of inspiration that absolute evil did bring about but you're right you know and there's plenty of that all around the world like Boko Haram and whatnot but now we start getting into the strategic priorities of what matters on the grand scheme of scale what they actually threaten um I don't want to sit here getting into bloody stacked um, strategies and politics with you but there's actually like a, a key point to note mate for you know, all veterans and, and infantrymen and the like watching this is that we sign up for uncertainty. We sign up for the possibility to go and do whatever. And the fact that some of us got to do that and some of us didn't doesn't make us any better than anyone else. It makes us more experienced yeah. in those areas. But in particular within our veteran community working forward and moving forward from here is it's so important for us to acknowledge the fact that we all signed up for service. We all had different journeys along the way and that doesn't make us better because some of those people who never got those opportunities would have potentially performed better than us. They just never got the opportunity to do yeah. so, but they still signed up for the opportunity to do that. And that makes them better than the majority of everyday people in our population because they're willing to openly sign up to something that was yet to be written and could have had their death tomorrow, could have had their death the next month, could have had them do things that they never thought they would have to do as a human being or nothing or sit back in an FOB and do nothing. You know, they never got to pick those adventures. So um, I don't know. What's the veteran community like over there with you at the moment? You know, here in Australia, we have a lot going on with mental health and all this sort of good stuff. I'm just um, intrigued to hear what the situation is with you. I mean, I particularly, I, I, I'm not too involved with it. Um, I don't I don't really think that there, there's a huge community um, in terms of, you know, involvement. I think a lot of guys get out and are, are happy to get out and just you know crack on with something new there is obviously yeah. people you know there's a you know there's a, a bunch of guys on social media there's a bunch of guys doing tv um but i think the the engagement with with regular joe public is is very limited it's not you know it's definitely not what the americans have got um in terms yeah, of sure. in terms of support for for you know veterans that are, you know are struggling never, never gonna have that the americans and i lived a couple of years there like i said before until you're attacked on your own home soil, you're never going to have that, you know, and that's that's part of what we sign up to do and we didn't sign up for that recognition, but that you just can't compare it to the Americans until you have like a, a 9-11 style incident, to be honest, yeah. Or a Pearl Harbor, fuck. Um, yeah, man. But, um, yeah, like, people are people are appreciative, but, you know, every time I meet someone that, that, that you know, is new in my life, that, you know, they, they don't have a fucking clue what the army does or what they've been doing. It's like, they don't even know that Afghan's a thing. It's like, oh, I thought you boys were out in Iraq. It's like, well, we've kind of been doing another thing in another country for 17 years. It's, you know, they, they, they generally just don't know that. It's not because they're ignorant. It's just because they've not been exposed to it. Um, and that, I would say that's the, the vast majority of the public. Um, unless they're... Been like, a, mate, that was literally the same as us until last year. Exactly the same, you know. We are now having all these catch-up conversations because we've had this critical report um, and incident going through, but... Yeah, that's it. And it's, that's actually been so hard for a lot of our veteran community to comprehend is that such an important part of their life, their life the part of their life that saw them to absolute greatness isn't even, excuse me, understood, let alone recognised within the regular community. And that's where it's very easy for them to lead to a sense of entitlement. But 
it's fascinating, isn't it? How something yeah. can be your entire life and not even a blip on the radar of someone else's. Yeah, we had a similar a similar instance to you know what you were talking about earlier on about you know you wanted to go and do something to the to you know one of those guys if you'd had the chance. We had a similar incident where a Royal Marines uh, platoon sergeant had you know he'd been on tour for back to back tours for a while maybe three or four, you know, back to back. And then he had, he had already lost about two or three guys from his platoon that deployment. And then um, he ends up getting a, a contact and AH comes on on, uh, on scene and takes a couple of guys out and then they go and do the BDA and they find this guy who's, you know, critically injured, uh, critically wounded, you know, Taliban bloke. Um, and he gets caught on, on head camera saying, that I'm, I'm going to fucking kill this guy. And he does. Um, yeah. and then a, a few years later that gets out, I think it was from a, an aggrieved ex-wife or something like that. I remember and, saying that, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that was, uh, that was quite distressing for the public, you know, that it was kind of very device, divisive, you know, half the public yeah. was saying, fuck them. That's what they fucking deserve. And then the other half was outraged. At, uh, how, how could this be, be happening? Um, and it just goes to show like, you know, people generally have had their life so, so comfortable throughout 20 years or throughout 20 years of, of modern warfare that they don't even have an a, an idea of what you know the members of society who are in the armed forces have been in, engaged with um mm -hmm. and that's you know i'm not condoning that at all obviously um but at the same time it's like that's the realities of war people are going to do things you know with clouded judgment um you know as is, is he is he evil is he you know a horrible person absolutely not i'm sure he's got a wife and kids that he loves dearly but he, he maybe just made a bad bad decision through through clouded judgment because he'd been overstressed for so long and for such a and for you know such an extreme amount of stress for so long um that he you know end up coming to that that um that decision on that day but it's it's just like people are just unexposed to it. they're not exposed enough to to you know what your 18 year old guys are you know fucking having to carry on patrol what they're having to do when they fucking engage with the enemy um what they're having to do when they you know they one of their own is wounded you know they they just generally don't have a clue what what we've been facing recently in yeah recent absolutely man and, you know part of that i actually take great pride in the fact that we sort of sign up to protect our nation as people physically mentally and emotionally and part of that is you know i'm actually very happy for them not to know some of that evil in the world but you know there's also so many huge lessons learned to brought out about and we're talking about afghanistan in particular here you know this has been our nation australia's longest war i'm pretty sure it's the same for you guys and you know just that in itself you know there's obviously new mistakes that have been made new lessons that have to be learned and recorded including you know back-to-back -back deployments and the actual reason why you know we decompress people and manage them along the way and make sure they have breaks in between and um, you know, we can backtrack and look for some common threads in some of those issues, be those societal issues, behavioral issues or tactical issues like you discussed beforehand, but also just the appreciation that, you know, we need to politically make sure we have these clearly defined strategies and units of measures and communicating those things. And because the issue with soldiers at, at all levels is that, you know, we're very adequate at going out there and finding things to be done, and particularly when there's obviously shit that needs to be done. Um, so you need to make sure that, you're ensuring it's in accordance with the standards you need and what needs to be done there on the ground as a part of the strategy. And at the same time, and I don't know about you guys, but in our experiences to make sure that you are um, allowing them to do what needs to be done and not all of a sudden bringing in new units and measures such as um, risk acceptance and mitigation and actually denying them from doing what glaringly needs to be done because you actually impact them a lot more. And I've had a few chats with, a lot of other international guys as well, particularly as things started to draw down, they started to lose lots of casualties over there, whereby they have some of their, their biggest emotional injuries from not being allowed to actually do what they could have done. Yeah. Um, and not so much in revenge of their mates, but just in the simple fact of feeling fulfilled in the task that they've been trained and prepared their whole life to do type stuff. Yeah. I'll probably just skip forward a little bit. Um, okay, do it. To, you know, point where you become to OCSF selection. You know, oh, yeah. kind of, get, kind of getting off, off a, you know, taking a big leap here, but kind of getting skipping a lot, a lot of your career, but getting to the OC SF selection. Um, yeah. How did that role come about for you? And was that something that you you chose, or were you selected into that that position? 
Uh, I always, always wanted to do it, to be honest. Uh, so I was over with the US. Uh, well, actually, it was the big selection part was for us. Uh, each year, one captain got sent over to do the exchange with the US 75th Range Regiment and then included a deployment with their classified task force. And I was adjutant uh, and then deployed over to do that. And I sort of secured before coming back that I was going to do that role. Uh, and I just love that, that training and investment and, and it also sort of comes back to a bit of the story I was telling you previously about, you know, even my first years as a uh, lieutenant within the infantry battalion, you know, and seeing how important it was at those initial ab initio levels, including particularly this part, this uh, selection and training of the future generation to make sure that it was done the right way, not only just in what you achieved at that personal level, you know, particularly when you're in special forces and, you know, but gaining entry into any form of exclusive, let alone elite organization, there's always sort of egos and attitudes involved. And I really wanted to help try and, and cut through some of that and, you know, and do what I can to influence, to make sure we're really taking things up to the next level. So uh, yeah, I ended up coming back and it was at a time whereby we were really going through a bit of a transformation. This is 2016 in the way in which we were selecting people because operations were drawn down in Afghanistan and we were really focusing a lot more on the Asia Pacific region and tasks became less and less defined but what became more defined was the need for higher levels of emotional intelligence less reliance on physical capabilities as priority um, and more and more focus on selecting the right person that we could train to do the right things and I know that sounds very straightforward but there really is sometimes a bit of a philosophical switch and I was benefited by being able to bring in um, a sports psychologist, a psychiatrist, a behavioural psychologist, um, a couple, most of those were, were women, to be honest, um, and a couple of other former members who are now in sort of sports and high performance. And we did everything from cortisol testing and putting people through um, parameters whereby we were actually testing the buildup of stress and levels and everything in the body um, through to really refining things like deprivation of basically love languages, basically ways in which people feel valued, you know, things like silent running, things like isolation, creating extra uncertainty, trying to entice things like anxiety and anticipation within the people even further, and even combining a lot more of elemental training. So in the elements, you know, embracing cold, embracing dark, embracing things like that. So mate, it was fantastic. And yeah. as far as like being a bookend to my career, being able to really sit down, redefine, redevelop, and then execute that as the selection course and then that ongoing training that we put into and, and assessment criteria and monitoring that we put into the reinforcement cycle. You can imagine that I was at a point in my time where I had done pretty much all the different operational capabilities and some other cool stuff within special forces bookended the other end by what was still the hardest thing I'd ever done in my career, which was a selection course at a personal level, breaking you down yep. physically and mentally to reveal you emotionally. And then I was able to finally like pick back threads from where I was here designing and assessing this course back to where I was there all the way through my career and really help to identify what were those key attributes that I had to develop along the way to be here? What were those environmental or human factors that helped to influence that? And really start quantifying some of the emotional intelligence that I actually had within me and just putting it into words and putting it into frameworks and structures. And my, I loved it. Like literally as far as like, you know, opening up my brain and my emotional intelligence, you know, tenfold, it all happened in those sort of 18 months there at SFTC. And it was fantastic. And from a personal satisfaction level, mate, you know, from being able to design this course that was literally putting people through all these different layers of assessment to then being able to spend the better part of a year investing in those individuals. And, you know, I had all the the officers in addition as my, the officer trainees as my, my personal Padawans, as far as, teaching them all of the successes and mistakes that I'd made tactically through across all the theaters I deployed to. There's just, there's just nothing like that. And you can imagine these are, yeah. you know, these are high performance people. They're not people, they're not sort of regular people. They're, they're at the level of high performance and they want to become elite and they are sponges and they are chomping at the bit for anything you can give them. And that's also a huge responsibility. And that's where I wanted to micromanage and do that part myself because I'd seen too many other people bring personal arrogance and ego and the wrong things into it. Yeah. Um, but it was so satisfying and I even imply that now to people who sort of get out of the military and lose their way because they're no longer able to perform to their greatness. 
being able to find a way to be able to give back and pass on that knowledge and mentor and train is one of the best cathartic and therapeutic methods that I've ever found because it replicates what I was able to do in that latter part of my career on that course. Yeah, that uh, that self-evaluation uh, portion that you talked about there, um, was there anything that you uh, particularly implemented in terms of the, the training package or the training course that you, you, you put in because of that self-evaluation or do you think it was just general an overview of yourself that allowed you to have a better understanding of what what you were looking for in blokes? I think in particular, it really helped me to bring in a lot more in um, some of the finite selection criteria for the officers, particularly at the end, and in particular, some of my justification for keeping or, or removing some of the people in the boards of selection. Um, and again, that was just actually through conversations by which I had to provide briefings up to the respective unit commanders and even the special forces commanders to, to really help justify that, you know, despite these people achieving greens across the board and physical attributes, these other character attributes they demonstrated were actually the, the, the makings of potential um, culture cancer. Um, and it, it was really fun, you know, going in there and having these emotional intelligent conversations. Some of them got like very combative yeah. <laughs> because this was at a time whereby people are really wanting to, you know, build and grow their capability and they need more people they need you know and they it's very easy to get stuck into this superficial um assessments of you know some of these people that look like modern day warriors but um, we were sort of experiencing already some of the stirrings and issues from across the command as far as what happens when you don't focus enough on the character and personality traits of culture and focus too much on operational capability as yeah. the pendulum was staying swing back the other way you know we had some fantastic seasoned operational warriors who were really lacking their relevance in being able to support the large part of hearts and minds and influencing strategic partners, political leaders and all those sort of things. And some of the other stuff we needed to do back home and in our local um, international environment. So, you know, it was really trying to make sure that we weren't simply building forces and picking people that were good to deploy to high combat operations, but couldn't, sustain themselves and best represent us within um, those lower but more strategic and more increasing roles that we needed to fulfill. I think that I think that, is, that goes across the board now as well, just in, you know, go back, taking it back to regular infantry units, you know, um, you know, I'm, I'm just guessing, but I guess back in the day, your best blokes would have been the fucking, you know, like you said, the, the, you know, ultimate warrior, whoever, or whatever, you know, the guy that yeah. can do all the pull-ups and fucking do the best PFT or whatever. And, you know, as an absolute, absolute he-man. But what what I began to notice as I as I kind of went on different courses and grew grew through the ranks is that those guys are useless if, and if they can't stand in front of a platoon and deliver a set of orders, or they can't even talk to the boss and tell them why they're implementing these control measures. You know, it's like they don't know why they're doing something. So there's no point in being the best, at, you know, physically if you can't uh, cognitively, you know, fucking put it together. Um, yeah, that's that kind of kind of seems as what you were just describing there. Um, absolutely, and that, that's it. You know, we would get to the points at the end. Of the, the the best part was, I remember on that first course, we got to a point whereby we had to stop some of the activities because some of the people we had were literally going to break themselves before they stopped because they were so emotionally invested in what they were doing. Yeah. You know, and that's the person that I can train to do anything. Obviously, they've had to get through a number of gates to get there, but it's that person that's actually not truly outside of their physical comfort zone. It's, you know, that former Ironman, that former football player, professional football player, whatever, who then when they finally get through that crumble, you know, that's what we're trying to remove. But those who lost their physical and mental resilience a long time ago, but their heart is literally holding onto that dumbbell. Um, you know, they're the people that are worth their weight in gold. And that's the inspiring part, seeing that, you know, you, you can, you can mold that metal into whatever you need it to be. Yeah. Um, and then just a, in terms of um, selecting for officers and, and en enlisted lads, how how's the, how does that differ? Um, are they are they you know doing the exact same things, but you're just you know aware of the officers who are in the pack, or are they you know are they involved in different tasks uh, and different training? So they're doing the exact same thing and more. So the officers had to attend a pre week for the selection course where we absolutely smashed them in training. Uh, sorry, in planning. Uh, and then, uh, you know, it was, a, it was definitely a pre-fatiguing exercise. And then throughout the actual selection course, they're assessed on additional criteria that include leadership, um, 
and some others that are in intellectual property and I can't mention, but, yeah. you know, they're, uh, yeah, they're assessed against those. And they're, they're often put in leadership positions. But then again, mate, they're put in Taylor and Charlie positions where they're not in leadership positions to see because the art of being a great leader is learning how to also be a great follower and a great supporter when needed. So um, there are much more expectations on them. It was also a very interesting philosophical time within our unit, particularly with the drawdown, again, from um, high-end warfighting operations in the Middle East to really start to do a proper assessment on what was actually the capability requirement of our special forces officers at that time. Um, you know, the alphas, the platoon commanders, those who could go out and kick doors in with their dudes were rapidly drawing down and much more reliant on those who could, you know, very quickly be able to provide strategic back briefs to ministers and foreign government agents and things like that to be able to then gain approvals to deploy forces for short notice tasks. You know, whereas actually a lot of those most seasoned platoon commanders who've been kicking in doors for the last four or five years in the unit couldn't do that themselves because they weren't, they didn't have the correct aptitude, character traits, but most particularly emotionally intelligence. And then how we look to actually provide mechanisms within the selection and training continuum to help even start to depict potential roles therein. So, yeah. you know, it's as, as if anyone, <laughs> if anyone goes insane with overthinking, <laughs> I sit here and overthink everything and you're sitting there overthinking the overthinking and, but it's fantastic. You know, you're looking at it through the lens of potential capability as opposed to, you know, trying to scrape the bottom of the barrel. So these are good problems to have. Yeah. It just comes from a place of, again, OCD and trying to, to over-engineer things to as near as possible perfection that it's very easy <laughs> to tie yourself out very quickly. Yeah. Um, I always like to uh, express to people how, how impressive, you know, regular guys regular human beings are that you know decide to join the infantry and um you know proceed to other you know higher levels of uh, of operating and one of the ways that yeah. you know i i think of of doing that is just if getting a, getting someone to describe an environment where you'd have had to work through a complex uh problem um and you've had to reorient it or, or orient it yourself as a leader uh be that on on operations or um, even back in back in barracks in Australia, like could you maybe think of a, a scenario where that's happened to you, where it's been so complex that you just you never ever thought that this would be a problem that, that you would be um, tasked with with solving? Oh, there's actually a lot that jump into mind. I want to find one that's <laughs> like actually relatable and, and enjoyable. Um, <clears throat> oh, so one extremely fun, complex problem I had to work through was actually when I was the VXO or the company 2IC for the commando company. Uh, and we needed to, we basically needed to demonstrate a rehearsal of cap operational capability that would see us tactically deploy a commando company from Sydney up to Papua New Guinea um, in a training exercise as opposed to an actual operational exercise and land a commando force element in and then conduct some operations. And, you know, it sounds cool easily tactically, but then, it, you know, we wanted to fly a commando company in, conduct a parachute load follow, you know, then go to shore with our Zodiacs and, you know, be prepared to conduct full mission profiles and things like that. But the realities are there's levels and layers of customs and border control and clearances <laughs> and diplomatic passes and everything else in between. And, my company commander that I had at that time, he was never actually a um, commander platoon commander. He was a JTAC, but he he was a he had a fifty pound brain, mate. You know, he was the one schooling me on conversations between complicated and complex and the differences between the two. And yeah. I was just like, Ugh. Um, <laughs> so then he's like, "Hey Heston, I'm going to send you, and you get to pick one um, one soldier you want to send with you, one commander you want to go with you, because you know it's always better to just operate in pairs and." I want to be able to land the company in here and do this. And your job is to go and make it happen. So I had a week where I had to just get myself over to Papua New Guinea, which I hadn't been to for, oh, I went there once in my infantry days. And I had to very rapidly acquaint myself with every single layer of government that I could to get to a point whereby in accordance with all army training standards, you know, I had everything from, the local Papua New Guinean reconnaissance force guys out there on their banana boats on the drop zone acting as safety craft yeah. 
through to, <laughs> you know, pre-collecting a drop of passports to have them pre-stamped, you know, parachute drop of passports in a parcel to have them pre-stamped. So it was when the guys landed on, sh- by the time the guys landed in their boats and the boats landed on shore, they'd all been stamped and they weren't breaching international law and policy. Holy and, shit. Mate, it, it was fantastic. But to top it off, for the uh, for the prize for my um, success in doing so, what the OC also wanted to do was to test the Australian Border Force capabilities for their ability to detect small craft infiltrating from Papua New Guinea back to Australia. <laughs> so what we did is we got a flotilla of our F-470 Zodiacs, which are 4.7-metre black dinghy Zodiacs, uh, loaded up with... Um, two or three men per Zodiac. I think we had about eight Zodiacs at the end of it. We call it the flotilla. And I got to, as the company 2IC, go back to being a platoon commander and command the flotilla driving from an island in the Papua New Guinea all the way down to Weeper uh, in the north of Australia. I think it took us three days, <laughs> about three layers of our skin chafed off every single person. It included going to... Um, beaching on one island one night only to wake up in the morning and see the low tide made us carry these things about 400 meters out past <laughs> coral and turtles and you know the tide went out 400 meters but it was at half yeah. a, a meter level it was ridiculous um mate it was it was incredible and you know just as far as that was that was one of those points just like hey like there really isn't something that i can't solve with the right team and with just the right purpose and mindset and it was just incredible. And that so much of that came down to practically solving problems, but also like just engaging with people and, um, you know, likability and leadership. I had to lead. That's my mum sewing stuff in the back, by the way. That's not my just cross dressing. <laughs> I didn't even notice that. <laughs> uh, I just saw that. It didn't, yeah, you know, likability versus leadership. I had to make, you know, like the Papua New Guinea nationals and all that and then the diplomats and stuff like me. And, you know, <laughs> you would bring into these people harebrained ideas and it's not like with the authority with special forces we're doing this they could be like get the hell out of my country yeah. it was yeah it was it was fun it was appreciating it didn't matter who you are an authentic voice carries its own authority you have to convince people and take them on the journey and, and make them earn and win trust in you and that only comes from being competent in yourself and also um your character as well so there's so many great life lessons along the way yeah how was it how was it living I, for three i days never do boats? that again it'll be all too soon <laughs> how was it living off the boats for three days mate like just you know the true test of culture is when it's no longer fun and that was <laughs> not fun but we made it so much fun you know mate, we're driving along and then next thing in the zone the next thing like we're driving through a school of tuna that's jumping next to us and one of my guys who's um who was bloody part Aboriginal was hooking a line in and pulling thing up and skinning off this bit of tuna. And it was that hot beating down on our black Zodiacs that he'd cut these fine slivers of tuna and was cooking them like, Fuck you know, hell. on the side of the rubber, it was that hot. And, you know, he'd drive up past me and give boss taste this sashimi. And, you know, it was just, <laughs> and you look, you look over there and there's a guy with his pants pulled down the medics, like putting cream on these like bleeding sores on his butt that are chafing and, Oh, but it's just, you know, these are the stories you catch up with the boys and have beers about. And it's, it's always, it's, it's, now a, it's now a measuring stick. It's a unit of measure for any potential adversities you ever have in the rest of your life. Just like that's why we do selection courses. That's why we do our initial entry into the army. You need to have a benchmark to know what you can go through. Um, you know, when the going gets tough, it's great to have these, these fond memories and experiences to look back on saying, you know, hey, I've... <laughs> I've done this worse. And when you're with your team, hey, you remember that time we did this? <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm sure you've been good ones too, man. Oh, man, I've seen enough guys with ball rub and fucking, ar- you know, the, the chafing in their arse cheeks or whatever. Um, oh. Just, uh, just yeah, and I, that's an impre- impressive story. Just uh, yeah. describe some of the, the impressive things that you've seen for, from your blokes uh, throughout your time as a... As a you know, as a commando or as a platoon commander or just in general from your time in, in, in the in the army? Yeah, so a couple of key ones really stand out to me. Uh, I mean, look, I'm always so instantly, so readily and privileged to be inspired by those that I have been responsible for, you know, 
bottom up versus top down. Unfortunately, a lot of throughout my career, I've actually had key issues with uh, above me and expecting more from those I've been responsible to, uh, expecting them to feel more responsibility for those under them, um, as opposed to playing politics up and out. You know, I've openly clashed with the majority of my hierarchy and you know there's been a bit of personal development along the way but i probably wouldn't change any of that because i know where my true passion and motivation lies but i remember afghanistan 2012 um there was uh, sergeant hekmatullah had actually just killed three australians during a green on blue attack and during this time the australian government called uh, cease operations for all of our conventional forces they had to return that to their bases um, and this unfortunately came within 48 hours of the other commander platoon that I was over with, there with in Afghanistan lost two of their guys, Mervyn Nate, from our same company, Mervyn Nate, to a chopper crash. So they were sort of out of operations doing that. So there was an SASR troop and my commando platoon, and we partnered to conduct um, about three weeks' worth of operations to track down this Sergeant Hekmatullah. And we sort of knew who he was, and we were tracking him through technical means. But there was one night in particular, and it was about, let's say it was about four o'clock, three o'clock in the afternoon. And we had a pretty accurate location on this guy. And we had human intelligence that he had planned to try and basically to conduct an exfil that night out through a a valley that was, you know, really difficult, thick terrain, uh, let alone complex as far as it had local Afghan army outposts. It had Taliban positions, stuff like this, um, Taliban insurgent activities. And if he got through that valley, then he was going to exfil to Pakistan and we would not be able to pursue him over the border and yep. all that good stuff. And all that I could muster was two Black Hawks to be able to get us out there just because shit was all over the battle space, even though this was like the blatant priority. Yep. All that we could get was two Black Hawks because of crew hours and all this. So I remember turning to one of my um, team commanders, my 1-1, one, one, who was my senior sergeant. And I was like, hey, look, this is the situation. Um I need you to have a think about getting out there and doing whatever you need to do in order to deter him from getting out. Like your task mission, I gave him a task effect is disrupt. You are to disrupt this Valley. So as he does not able to conduct his exfil out to this location, uh, you know, in order to, you know, it was a strategic priority yeah. for this guy to be able to be maintained. If he was maintained the AO, then we could prosecute him in the next couple of days. And then for that sergeant to go away and make his team and have a look at the equipment available to us, you know, we just actually come back from a lot of missions and stuff and we're still in the whole rebombing phase. And, you know, he came back and basically sort of told me his plan and he really needed to get out there and see the terrain. We didn't even have good mapping of this area. Like it was not a proper sophisticated special forces intelligence dev dev preparation. It was two hours go. And I needed to get him out there because the helicopters had to uh, insert um within the next four hours or some crap you know and i didn't even get a diligent back brief from him i just knew that i trusted him yeah. and i made sure that he particularly back briefed me on his um casivac casually evacuation measures and how he was going to maintain his command and control particularly back to me and back to assets that i could push to him in support and once he did that it was guns go and get out there and get amongst it and it was so fantastic. I was there sort of standing to by, by the ops room with my course on element out there ready with another guys ready to, to step up and go out there if he needed help. But, you know, next thing, all that we hear is just the, the feedback report that, you know, all sorts of shit's going on. And, you know, I remember someone, the CEO catching me in the mess. We'd like eat cereal at, you know, 12 o'clock at night or something like what's, I'll just say, what's what's the one one doing out there? And he's like disrupting, sir. He's like, yeah, he's doing a pretty good job. I was like, what do you mean? He's like, well, we're getting reports from the Afghan army that they don't know what's going on. We're getting local reports from people calling up saying there's a huge coalition operation being conducted here tonight. And long story short, um, we got them guys out just before um, first light and got them back to base. And all the reports just started streaming in the human intelligence, like because he was meant to step off at first light that next morning. It's like. You can't come through here. There was some massive coalition operation back here. We've only seen two helicopters lift out. There's still so many more in here. They must be lying <laughs> waiting for you. And long story short, you know, mission achieved. That was, I think it was a total of, oh, what do you take? 10, 11 dudes, 11 dudes, you know, managed to conduct a commando as fuck operation to disrupt with an ill-defined task just to achieve an effect. 
um, that had a direct strategic impact on one of the most important strategic priorities we had at that time. I was so proud and I tell yeah. that story so much. Um, just the simple fact that sometimes you just need to trust people to get out there and get it done. And you can imagine that came from a place of this guy demonstrating his competence and character to me time and time before. But um, being able to just sit back and I'm like, I have zero credit. It was all this man and his team. And it's a pretty wild shit that, you know, they got fired on by an Afghan army post who didn't realise what was going on. But it all added to understanding that higher commander's intent um, and they achieved it and some. And I was, so, I was so proud to see that. And this is something that, that you know, I really did start the podcast to, to try and um, show to, to the wider society how, how impressive guys who have served are. You know, especially infantry guys, because you can they literally can fucking turn their hand to absolutely anything. You, like you like you said, like, I, I need you to go and do this, you know, um, absolutely high strung mission at such short notice, and then they over they overachieve. Um, yeah. And that, that's 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 my over overarching view of you know a good infantry yeah. dude or like you know just in general a good bloke that served in the in the army. Um, you give them a task and it will be done, but it will be done better than you're expecting. Um, there's not imagine, that was also that was also fraught with risk of like, you know, at the same time, like you, there's the opportunity for civilian casualties, the opportunity for something to go wrong was so paramount. But by just empowering you guys to have the trust and allowing them to, you know, demonstrate their their own individual brilliance, like it, you can imagine you go away and it actually sets everyone else up to the next benchmark where you have a new level of trust, a new level of experience, and a new level of expertise. Yeah, yeah. and, and I- it's all sitting there waiting to happen. Yeah, and there's actually a lot of guys that, you know, get in, in touch recently that are like, oh, I'm going to Sandhurst or I'm, I'm a new officer that's in this unit, blah, 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 you know, asking for my thoughts and my opinions. I'm like, fuck, like, you know, I'm just giving them my 10 pence. But, you know, if they are listening, it's like you have to trust and you have to empower your your, your subordinates. If you don't empower them, then you can't, um, you know, you can't allow them to develop and achieve success. And it's not just that, it's going to be their success. It will be your success as well. If you've empowered your yeah. subordinates to do a task and that's for you, then that's your success as well. But also if they fail, it's your failure as well. So, you know, yeah. t- take that. No, one absolutely. I mean, accountability has to start from the top and there's the, the biggest, the hardest part is in particular is allowing others to be able to demonstrate some of that potential within them without people becoming competitive and thinking that it's them relinquishing any power or any yeah. of their own influence. And the best thing you the best thing you can do and have to do is hold yourself and them accountable. You know, if they don't rise to the occasion, then you have to hold them accountable. If they do, you have to reward them. And if they don't, you also have to play some accountability in that fact that you're not just putting them out there to sink or swim. You're out there to coach and mentor at the same yeah. time. And like you said exactly, their failure is your failure. Their success is their success. Yeah. <laughs> and you're <laughs> then accountable to make sure that that success is continued and passed on and perpetuated. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I guess um, talking about you know people who have who have got out and um, you know getting in touch with me, the the very first reason I uh, came across you you as a personality was uh, one of the guys uh, reposted I don't know one of your posts about the the Brereton report, and that's when I that's when I discovered you personally, and then what was going on in Australia with the Brereton report. And, you know, I guess on the back of that, you, you, you started up Voice of a Veteran. Would that be correct? Yeah, well, so Voice of a Veteran, very quick story. In August of last year, I sort of had my own transition from the military uh, start of 2019. And I sort of went off the rails whereby I jumped into high paying jobs and I jumped into popularity and things like that. And all the all the superficial things I needed in order to provide me with purpose but i never realized that they gave me purpose that was myself instead of purpose outside of myself which is what i needed and at the same time we've been going through a lot in australia with this current report it's gone on for like four and a half years we've had sort of the seeds of doubt sown in not only our purpose of what we were doing in afghanistan but our purpose in supporting each other as people have been isolated and allowed to talk each other during the conduct of this inquiry, we just have had the suicide rate and mental health decline rate within our veteran community climb so huge. Whereas it's at above 700 veterans have committed suicide since 2011. I think last year alone was over 80 um, by the unofficial count and that's still tricking in. So uh, I got to a point in August of last year where I had my own first suicidal ideation and it took me to a place whereby 
I was able to essentially um, establish a more mature understanding of my own mental health and suicide and everything else in between, and also snap out of the state that I perpetuated down to, which was a state of entitlement and a state of um, just being sad at not being my greatest and um, asking and looking for others to solve my own problems, whereas I previously solved problems like I just spoke to you about beforehand. And um, it sort of snapped me into action. And I raised Voices of Veteran in order to provide me with essentially a an identity through which I could start to uh, put through and focus uh, what needed to be done and give myself the personal empowerment to do that, give myself a mission to be able to focus towards. And then uh, fast forward um, two months to the eighth anniversary of the death of my guy, Scott Smith in Afghanistan, 21st of October. Uh, And in the media here in Australia on that exact day, um, the Australian Broadcasting um, Corporation, ABC, released this report that was from a US Marine who was in a Huey in um, helicopter support of others saying that he heard a, a pop um, one night um, over the radio that was in parallel to some conversations talking about loadouts for taking um, detainees off target where the number changed from eight to seven and made the deduction eight years later that pop meant that we had executed someone and, and came on saying that that was fact and they actually named November platoon which um, had never really been ever done before so I, by this time, I just had a gut full. So I got on social media and and called this out and said, hey, I'm actually (laughs) the commander of November Toon and that's bullshit. Um, And enough people caught on to that, got in contact with the video, the TV stations. And next thing I was giving an interview and that went on our national TV. And then fast forward another couple of weeks, the next thing the Burton Report was released and my name was probably the most recent talking about these things and special forces as for nearly everyone else is still serving and can't do so and whatever. Um, and all of a sudden I was sort of the, the go-to guy to provide comment. Um, and at the same time, at this time, I'd reconnected with a lot of my old community who were suddenly going through this huge uncertainty and questioning of their culture and their community and their identity um, and really started to hit home at the heartstrings just to see all of a sudden our senior leaders, our chief of our defence force, our chief of army come out and start blaming the actions of 16 or 19 um, as being so bad that we're going to strip the honours and awards from 3,000 people that included 20 fallen heroes, that we're going to disband a squadron seven years after the last time we deployed Afghanistan, a squadron that had been in existence since the Vietnam War. And I just started to see leadership at the top level that was leadership by authority, leadership with entitlement and leadership that stood against everything that I stood for as a leader as I also watched it just abandon those who were literally those on the ground who I'd fought with and seen rise to their greatest and everything else in between. So you can imagine it sort of all created the perfect storm whereby I have just been reinstigated with a purpose to now finally be able to go back in and no longer have to demonstrate physical courage, but able to demonstrate moral courage to do what needs to be done by literally just speaking out authentically and with facts in support of the majority of my guys who are still serving but also with a design purpose to then be able to help educate the Australian public who are now being forced to better understand what we did in Afghanistan, because also in doing so, we set the conditions for the current and future generations to potentially be better understood and to have less uncertainty and feel less isolated when they transition out of military uh, into their civilian lives. So it's been a rapid three months, man. <laughs> <laughs> But it's honestly, like I was saying, going from my lowest point where I was last um, August through to where I am now, um, I'm not all the way back there, but you can imagine like that. The, I haven't felt such a strong purpose in a long, long time. Yeah. Um, and it's inspiring to be able to, and pri- being privileged to be able to, to be in the position I am at the moment, waging whatever campaigns I can. Damn. Um, I didn't I didn't realize about that about you. What was the catalyst that that led you to to having suicidal ideations? And w- was it your own self awareness that, uh, that allowed you to to snap out of it, like you mentioned, or was there an external uh, factor that that kind of helped you, you know, realize that you were having these negative thoughts? Um, no, it's good questions, man. I actually last night I actually have a presentation at one of our return servicemen's clubs here where I actually just finally put together a presentation on this and I'll do another one tomorrow night. And I've, I've been able to just like what I was saying to you beforehand about how I 
the start of the bookend of my career in special forces my, was my selection course. And the end bookend was, you know, running and redesigning that selection course and able to sort of trace back through attributes and actions and activities and events. I was able to do the same tracing basically back to the greatest moment of my life, my career, my, my deployments in 2012 and who I was personally, professionally, what I saw around me through to where I was in August at the lowest point where I literally the most logical thought in my head was that I had to remove myself from this equation for it to be fixed. That was yeah. the problem solved. Um, and I have been able to, and this is this presentation that I'll, I'll show you sometime that go back and track through the attributes that I had back at my greatness and the attributes that I had at my absolute lowest and start to plot the paths in between. And, you know, they also came from even my transition from the military. I took like nearly a year's worth of leave and the actual physical exit from the military was me doing some box ticking. I somehow, even on my pro on my um, profile had a waiver that I didn't need a psych screening. And it was just a comedy of errors that left me going, you know, this is a fucking joke. You know, we have a yeah. course for everything in the military. We don't have a course for transitioning and I've done, all these sorts of things and all this stuff's on my file. And you think I don't even need a psych screening? I'm like, you know, yeah. fuck off. You guys are just a joke. But anyway, I didn't care because I'm going to get on with my life. Yeah. Through to um, our Department of Veterans Affairs, which is like the government organization that's designed to support with liability and compensation for injuries and stuff during service throughout. And this is the culture within our defense and it is changing, but particularly within our special forces, you know, I never ever went and got any of my injuries recognized. Um, you know, I snapped, I completely snapped my patella tendon in 2014 and managed to avoid ever getting med downgraded or registering it. But then I had a piece of bone floating around in there that I needed a deliberate surgery to get done. And when I started to try and get that injury finally recognized after leaving service, it took 18 months for a doctor to pick up the same scan I had the day that I left the army. 18 months later and say, I could do a 45 minute procedure to remove this bone and you could run again. Yeah. And so all these things are perpetuating to me feeling just like so devalued coming from a place of greatness whereby I couldn't even achieve, you know, basic survival stuff because the system, because I was putting an entitled trust in the system and an expectation for it to come to me and support me with what I needed was being let down. And when I couldn't find employment that actually provided me with professional purpose. You know, I started chasing personal purpose. I started chasing um, superficialities like, uh, you know, drugs and alcohol um, in my relationship, in my life, like throughout my entire military career, um, I had kept myself in the closet. I'm actually gay, but I never was defined by that and was never comfortable with that myself. And when I left the military, I actually, you know, finally had a boyfriend and stuff like that. Yeah. And I thought that all these superficial things are the things that I needed, but all they ever did was provide me with extrinsic motivations and, and temporary satisfactions, but there was no fire and there was no purpose inside. And then all of a sudden that former fire and purpose inside that was the missions that we did overseas and the men that I did those missions with started to come under attack. And it started to come under attack in the public as stuff was being released to the public with this report. Um, I started hearing, you know, everyday Australians who previously had no idea and still didn't even know what we actually did. They just knew that whatever we did, we didn't do it the right way, yeah. which was completely wrong, which hadn't even held up to an investigation. It was still an inquiry that wasn't even released. And I wasn't even hearing anyone of our military leaders coming out and defending that simple fact. Through to them watching guys that I'd previously seen be, you know, absolute warriors be the most magnificent versions of themselves um, running into them and you know they've put on weight you can see that they're not even maintaining eye contact they're they're starting to the, the shell on the outside is starting to to waver let alone what's on the inside is starting to decay because they're declining in their emotional and mental state by all this and everything else is going on so and then mate on that late august um afternoon uh, i was actually sitting on my couch at home and I got a phone call from a guy who told me that a soldier that I was previously uh, the commander of had tried to kill himself um, by um, overdosing on prescription medication and had done so with um, his infant child also there, um, just in another room, um, not within visual, um, and had been found by his partner and intervention had occurred and he was fine. But, you know, I finished that call and I sort of sat there with all those external factors that were already making me fee feel devalued that 
I was well aware I was over reliant on superficialities and extrin- extrinsic motivators to get me through. And truly, this was another sort of dagger to that intrinsic motivation, that internal purpose that I had. And I started to really think about what that guy must have thought. And it must have been very similar to what I was feeling with all those external and internal factors. And then I started to problem solve and I started to think, how can we get enough attention? You know, this time it was already recorded that over 500, nearly 600 veterans had committed suicide, but I started to be maneuverous in my problem solving. I'm like, well, no special forces officers have killed themselves. And this might sound weird, but, uh, you know, particularly at the top levels of this, they're all ex generals. They're all ex whatever. There, there is a profile piece that, you know, a lot of people by that time had engaged within me in social media and even being gay or whatever, you know, you, I was breaking down stereotypes and there's, a, there's yeah. an image and there's a status and there's a whatever that achieves a cut through. So I was like, right, well, I need to be the next person to go and I need to be the last person to go and I need to do this in a way that gets enough attention so that people realise like it's not PTSD bubbling away in me. It's literally this process that you've taken me on the last 18 months and what you're continuing to expose my guys to. And, I, you know, it's not me trying to sound romantic or samurai or anything, but I, for that moment of logic, and whether it was a couple of minutes or whatever, the most logical thing in my head was that I had to kill myself. And I wrote a letter that I wanted to get to one of our senators to read out in front of our parliament. Um, I knew where I had prescription medications, Valium, in the cupboard, and I literally had my mindset that this was going to occur um, making sure who would find me. So my sister didn't find me all this good stuff. And the most cliche part is that it was uh, approaching about five o'clock when this occurred. And I had an 18 month old mini dash hound sausage dog who then literally came up and just put his head on my lap and started nudging me because it was his time to get fed. And, you know, people say dogs uh, yeah. have that level of intuitive and all that, but um what it was, was all of a sudden something else needed me. There was another purpose outside of self. This beautiful little creature like needed me to feed him. And all it took was that sort of split second snap out of, you know, the only thing that I can achieve my purpose was this, was there was another small purpose over here that needed me. And I sort of sat there for another minute and next emotions were I was just so disappointed and embarrassed, um, you know, because then logic came back in. It's like, you're a fucking idiot, you know. What is this going to achieve? Yeah. Um, I previously had a relationship with suicide whereby I'd lost one of my soldiers who took his own life on our deployment in East Timor um, in 2007. And I was 22 and I thought that, you know, things like suicide were um, predisposed. You know, people were, were born with these issues or, you know, something happens in their childhood or all of a sudden there's like a traumatic event that rewires the brain. And I'd finally been taken to a place whereby it was so logical to me that that's what wanted to occur. And, I actually got really mad with myself thinking about how much I would have disappointed my mom, my sister, you know, even my bloody dog. But then all of a sudden um, in the next breath, I I looked at the note that I was writing and I was like, mate, you have given that many brilliant orders groups and done that much brilliant planning throughout the years that if you can't be the person to read this out to the parliament and take people along this journey that actually really got you to this point, then who else is going to do it? Because the saddest thing about all these suicides is that they're the lag indicators and what's happening is all these poor families are the ones trying to represent the potential feelings and emotions and journeys their loved one went on. And the best thing I could do with this profile that I thought could achieve cut through in the news simply as being a statistic as a suicide could actually be to put it to use and put every ounce of my former military infantry and commando training to use and assembling the best team and people that I could to actually, you know, disrupt this mental health crisis, do what my one, one did and just get out there and do what needs to be done to disrupt what's going on and to achieve the strategic requirement that is um, taking on and supporting um, our veterans and our guys and changing the system and doing whatever is necessary to achieve what needs to be done. So mate, that's, (laughs) that's where I'm at right now. And unfortunately the burden report has taken over, but the burden report has really magnified and this is the part of the narrative I'm trying to tell the Australian people is that the Burn Report has really highlighted and magnified the callousness of some of the actions by our senior hierarchy in making aggressively assertive and overly authoritative decisions without considerations of the second and third order effects, without the considerations of the physical and mental health and well-being of those that it affects. 
We saw that manifest explicitly when our Chief of Defence Force stood up and said that he was going to request the categorical revoke of the meritorious unit citation from every member of the Special Operations Task Group and not even realise, care, let alone acknowledge that this included 20 fallen heroes whose families were there watching this and had already given all that their family possibly could with the loss of their loved ones. And that he as our senior general, let alone the politician he's trying to be and is posturing himself as, didn't even engage with things like the mandated support systems like our Department of Veterans Affairs to ensure that someone was there contacting those families so that they were not, their emotional trauma was not reopened by his statements in front of the Australian media, let alone yeah. the world. And um, I, I've been tracking this. And um, so the, I guess they, they were aware of the final, you know, re- report about six months prior to making a, you know, a televised announcement. So it's not as if they didn't have opportunity. So, you know, they could have, you know, had that, all that time to meet one by one with each individual family and say, look, this is what we're planning to do in the future. Like we want to talk with you previously out of respect for you know your loved one um you know just you know we're, we want to do it out of um out of respect you know but they didn't yeah. they kind of just, just threw it on the nation and it, it all comes down yeah. to what you said earlier on is is about is it's just weak leadership and you know what it, it's become you know and this is another it's lazy yeah. it's, it's lazy leadership you it's, know it's not just weak leadership you know these guys are, have no issues that you know they're textbook narcissistic they have no issues doing the hard yards. This is, what they're doing is actually just being lazy, mate, and they're just defaulting to authority because no one is challenging them. It's another uh, another phrase I've you know I've kind of cottoned onto as well is that all these generals are now becoming um, more politician like like characters rather than you know being a, an actual military leader. They're they're, they're yeah. playing the politics game and. Um, you know, you know, signal signaling their virtue to you know what they what they deem to be the most popular you know mindset you know audience uh, in the in the nation. But I, I'm from fucking Scotland. I, I've never been to Australia, but I know for a fact that Australians are hard enough to fucking take the facts of a report and deal with it themselves. They don't need some fucking pussy general telling them you know we're doing this. You know, we're we're stripping all these guys because they're all fucking evil. No. Lay out the facts. Let the fucking public make their own mind up about it. And I guarantee the 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 most common answer would be like, "Look, if you fucking murdering people, we don't we don't accept it." But for everyone else that wasn't involved with that, we we a hundred percent support you. And that that's that's what it comes down to. Um, Absolutely. In, in, in and my even mind, and I'm sure that's Australians, it's just we, common we're sense. We're in a democracy like you guys, mate. And the biggest shockwave has been that the Australian public has caught on to like this is an inquiry. So it wasn't an investigation. You know, it's not even enough evidence to take it to court. Now they're stepping up an investigation to do that. So all of this heartache has come from stuff that doesn't even hold up to a day yet in court. And that's been the most terrible part. You know, we could probably accept if it was the end of an investigation and these guys are now going to be charged, but yeah. no one's been charged. No one's been given a day in court and we're already punishing everyone. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing more undemocratic that we've ever seen in our modern generation. Well, in the UK, we've got a, an issue with uh, historic allegations. They've actually, there's an actual, you know, team for it. They're called the IHAT, historic, uh, Iraqi mm-hmm. Historic Allegations Teams. And basically what their job is to is to go around and look for uh, instances where, you know, soldiers might have performed out with the, the remits of the, the law of armed conflict and chase them down and, you know, prosecute them through the courts. It happened to, um, yeah. it happened to one of the guys here. He, he was involved. You know, a pretty famous battle, at battle of Danny Boy in, in in Iraq, and he ended up him and his section, you know, fucking assaulting a position and being it in a bunch of guys, a bunch of Iraqis, and then mm-hmm. you know this this is like a, you know, a serious like fucking assault on a position. Um, yeah. So the realities of war, are, the, yeah. the realities of war are that it's, it's pretty fucking gruesome, um, and so yeah. now this 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 poor guy and his family has been dragged through the through the ringer and for for the actual event that happened he actually won the military cross for that event so it's not as if it's like it's not as if it's like you know um inconsequential you know act you know it's a a real fucking reality of war uh and anyway him the poor guy and his family have been were dragged through the through the the courts and you know got to the point where he literally could have been put away for life 
for doing his job that he was awarded yeah. you know the military military cross for doing um as the ground commander for that for that team it's just like yeah. and the, you know there's been many many uh, instances of that even going as far back as like 40 50 years chasing guys from northern ireland who are involved in you know uh, the bloody sunday you know events um back in the day so it's like they're chasing them when when these guys are like 70 80 year old taking them through yeah. the courts three four times um but you know i think recently they've just made legislation where they you know they're stopping all that it's it's, it's going to be illegal to to track soldiers down for doing that and if they're not it, it, it's like some seven year seven year um what's it called statutory of some, limitations yeah, or something, something like that yeah. yeah i mean that makes sense yeah. like if you know if if you're not if it's not brought up immediately then i mean yeah that's I'm all for accountability where accountability is due. What unfortunately we're seeing now and I've lost the trust in is people and their ability to understand the true context through which that content or those incidents occurred. And yeah. that's why we're looking at things so one dimensionally, if anywhere even close to two dimensionally, as far as looking at that, that physical terrain, but it's the psychological, it's the emotional. We're talking about counterinsurgency. We're talking about so many other elements that, aren't portrayed in video footage that aren't portrayed in um, pictures that aren't portrayed even in stories you know i had to give evidence twice and they're asking me stories on missions of over eight years ago and i'm like look guys <laughs> you know but one huge part for me mate was that we went out on the every single mission we went out on the ground with we had to take the afghan partner force um and tragically when we withdrew from taran count every single one of the partner force that i was with in 2012 were executed by the taliban you know, where's the strategic accountability from our government for that? But let alone throughout all those years that we we're out with them on the ground, you know, where are all the reports from them about the, the war crimes that were conducted by Australians against their own people because we were there on the ground in support of them? And, you know, that doesn't mean that some of this stuff didn't occur. And I don't know. It has to go through the proper legal process. And are there questions and conversations where as well were some of these things that are alleged potentially even um, acceptable given the nature of the actual law over there and the actual situation over there and the actual requirements of counterinsurgency and the way in which um, operations were conducted, let alone um, in order to do so with second and third order effects, like I spoke to you about, you know, setting the conditions for the future generations like we were able to do positively in East Timor, also in Afghanistan, deterring um, the next generation for, remember, you know, sort of, engaging in insurgent or terrorist activities again you know we we were listening into the bad guys um and their leaders and their handlers back in other countries talking about you know their individual unit um insignia you know and how we wore our night vision goggles and you know the fact that the australians had beards and you know you'd hear stories like oh don't go into that area you know that's where the australians are you know go over into this area it's like, hey, make sure you don't do this. Or if you encounter these guys, do this. And, you know, the fact that we actually had um, a reputation for being extremely effective at our role over there, that it even permeated up to um, the communications and command and control levels, clearly demonstrated that whatever the way in which we conducted ourselves was not only effective on the ground tactically, but was actually effective operationally and strategically up where it really mattered. And that was destabilizing insurgent networks and command chains in and outside of that country. So there's a lot of this information that unfortunately isn't good and doesn't make um, media um, grabs because it is complicated and complex for Australians and the world to understand. But my, my biggest part at the moment is trying to bring some of this to the forefront because you can imagine, you know, we need some more positivity in our media in general yeah. these days, let alone supporting our, our veterans man and you know we need to support having more great citizens joining our military forces and more of our military forces turning back into great citizens and it starts with education and understanding so yeah man, it's a long path eh? you mentioned earlier on as well about your um your personal dealings with mental health issues and yep. you know you mentioned that there's a mental health crisis within the veteran community uh, in australia um yep. what what do you think it you know from your meetings with people throughout you know engaging in public uh public setting mm -hmm. or even on on television or whatever what do you think the you know the average australian opinion is of um what their soldiers have been been through and you know how how much awareness of the issues that potentially could 
uh, come on their shoulders do you, do you think is there for them? I was initially so afraid that the narrative that was being portrayed in our media was going to be the narrative that the Australian public grabbed onto. And that comes from a place of speaking with my grandfather who came back from the Vietnam War and here our Vietnam <laughs> veterans were, you know, spat on and burn their uniforms. And, you know, he spent many, many years, um, never, talk, you know, decades never talking about it. And I was so fearful and made comments of the fact that I was speaking out because there was no way I was letting that happen to my guys because without that identity and without that community, that's where too many just slip off into the darkness and they're never seen again. But, mate, the Australian public is smarter than most politicians and media give them credit for and they are more inspired by um, the pillar that is our defence force and the people who defend our country and carried forward. We talk about the Anzac spirit dating back to our days in Gallipoli. And the public response has been overwhelming, mate, and it has really helped to dissipate any fears I had that this would be seen to shed and, and indeed have the task stick to tarnishing the many for the sake of the few. And, the, and when I say for the sake of the few, I now, know, I now talk about for the sake of the few and the actions that have been demonstrated by those senior generals that have not demonstrated Anzac spirit, have not demonstrated our core values, and the Australian public has immediately identified that and does not engage with and identify with them and they have been found wanting. Um, and it has been so heartening to really actually see this whole situation provide an opportunity for more Australians to better understand what we did in Afghanistan, what we better did, or what we understood, better understanding of who our veterans are and what they do, but also to really, really, outside of Anzac Day and Remembrance Day, demonstrate a very strong rising of the, the, the dormant um, support that is there for our, our servicemen and women. And also, even within the veteran community, it's really helped to bring it together and span a lot of bridges across some of these previous um, demographics and age demographics between Vietnam veterans and whatnot. Because yeah. you know, when one of us is under attack, we're all under attack. And yeah, that's when we all come together and, and we all fight back stronger than anything else you've ever encountered. And the Australian people are right there and they have our backs and they have our support and they're being, they're being vocal about it. So it, may, it is watching this report be released by our generals and by our politicians was the point that made me feel the most disgusted to call myself an Australian, the loan of veteran. But the response by the Australian people and by uh, those veterans who are joining in, in this has made me um, more proud than ever to be an Australian and to be a veteran. So yeah. it's uh, it's been it's been a terrible to start and, and a great way. And the, the strength is just growing, mate. We're just getting started. Yeah, exactly. And and what do you what do you personally or what does you know the the system in general have you know ongoing for the for the future in terms of making making change? Yeah, mate. Well, so um, the key part that now with voice of a veteran and it came back to it comes back to you know that moment i had on my sitting on my couch um about you know fuck it i should be the one reading this not anyone else so that that campaign line is taking control of the veteran narrative you know i'm sick of people talking about us be they've talking about us in an inquiry talking about us in the media it's time for veterans to take control of our narrative and to help educate the australian public to better understand us and to help each other feel more understood feel more relevant and more engaged um, and then it's setting apart, um, activating that veteran community to take control of solving their own problems, particularly within our mental health and our recovery system and our transition system. You know, we've become overly reliant on waiting on government departments or ex-service organisations and charities and all this to provide us with what we need. It's time to take control of ourselves to remove that expectation and a weight from others to solve our own problems and re-empower ourselves to do things. Um, and again, joining together as teams is doing that. And then, mate, and particularly this is my part here, linking in with as many power players as I can to then take those fixes up to a systemic level and start to bring about change in those government agencies, those policies within the Defence Force itself. And you can imagine a lot of this is actually really just talking about cultural change. Letting our senior leaders and those future senior leaders know that their actions are going to be held accountable regardless of what rank they have because every Australian is a voter and we will act in accordance with what we believe and know is morally right and democratic yeah. right, democratically right and we will no longer remain silent in doing so and we are also smart enough and adaptable enough to bring together people and bring together projects 
to affect and create change at every level. Um, because again, the last thing that I finally realized, and it takes me back to those Papua New Guinea insertion days, is that um, why not? You know, yeah, exactly. why not? And too often in my in my spiral to misery to that time in August, the why not was simply me being the only person holding myself back because I um, adopted a mindset of entitlement as opposed to responsibility. And I was allowing and waiting for others to solve problems that I could find ways to do. So it's a uh, grand scheme of things. It's all about mindset. It's all about cultural change. But there are some small objectives along the way that we can help to make sure that we don't only fix the problem, but um, actually remove it completely from the orbit. Well, yeah, like your, your, your personal story is fucking very um, inspiring. And I think you should be really proud of what you and, and the, you know, your supporters are, are doing for, for veterans in Australia. And, you know, it, it, does, it does transcend into other nations. You know, you know, I'm following you from, from the UK, so I'm sure there's people following you from all over. So it does transcend uh, international borders. But I think you should definitely be very proud of the fact that you are, you know, making actual change to people, to help people's lives. Um, and that's something that's, you know, you can't put a price on that. Um, no, that's it. Mate. That, yeah. That's all the... That's the primary inspiration right now. And you know what? The the best part about all of this, for better or for worse, is that it's occurring in this coronavirus post-2020 now, 2021 world, where we are actually so isolated internationally. You know, Australian borders aren't going to probably be open for another year, things like this. So, you know what? It's time to sort out our own backyard because, like you said, mate, you know, this and these stories aren't the first that they've ever happened in the Western veteran um, society, uh, let alone in the world. And it's not going to be the last time. And, you know, our great alliances, our five others alliances with, the, you know, the UK, the US, Canada, New Zealand, um, here in Australia, you know, we have to start working together as an international community, as a veteran community as well. So um, we need to sort our own backyard out and then also learn and make sure that these incidents and, and situations don't happen again. But and then also be ready to support each other, mate, and yeah. take our lessons learned to, to help others and, get told to fuck off in Scottish or Celtic or whatever you people say, but um, get at least be there and be, be ready and be willing to support our international community once we sort our own backyard out first. And that's, mate, that's 2021. That's our priority. Yeah, that's good. Uh, we're just going to probably wrap up here just now, but um, what piece of advice would you uh, would you look back to your 18-year-old self and, and lay on thick to that person? Oh, authenticity and leadership by example um you know i spent so much time looking to others as we naturally do to try and see what part of them i wanted to replicate to be myself um and all that I ever did was create uncertainty because i never lived up to that and just appreciate that the best thing you can do is go through and lead by example that lead by example that you'd be happy to follow and keep your eyes and ears open along the way and yeah. just really discover who your authentic self is and then just uh, in, uh, in closing then, what would your, your final thoughts be over your, your whole um, time served and then post, post-military post career as well? Oh, uh, shit. <laughs> Quick summary of your entire life. Um, right. Uh, shit. I don't know, mate. Um, quick summary of my life <laughs> i was able to be i was i was able to be my best because i worked with some of the best you know i am my best when i'm around others who are also their best um and it's so important for me to move forward appreciating that i need others to help me be great and i need others to help me be accountable and be selfless um and to also appreciate the number one thing that i also need is a true and authentic purpose i need a reason why yeah. Um, and that reason why has to be more than me. It has to be more than survival. It has to be for a greater cause. And um, that might make me constantly pursuing something for the rest of my life, but doing so and doing so with the best team supporting me and me supporting them and being responsible and accountable to them is what brings out the best in me. So <laughs> that's a good way to close out. Um, but let me just say once again, thank you very much for uh, taking the time out of your evening to, to sit down and, and you know spread the word um you know a lot of guys do get a lot from these long form discussions and um yeah absolutely thank you i appreciate you taking the time 
mate, thank you so much for doing this. You know, a huge part that I've also realized is, is a part of my therapy, part of my treatment, a part of my self-development is just talking and having these conversations. You know, we talk so much about mental fitness and mental health. But for me, mate, this is a mental fitness session. I've literally just done like a two and a half hour workout with you. And as opposed <laughs> to saving up for my therapist once a week, like they're my mental health sessions. This is mental fitness, mate. You and I just having these clear and authentic conversations and helping me build pathways, you know, you know, helping me listen to you as well and putting it out there so others can, can hear it. And you're the one who's sitting there, you know, going out there first and being proactive and having these conversations. So, mate, thank you for what you're doing for, for not only me, for not only you, but for our, our, our communities combined. So my thanks to you, mate. Well, cheers, mate. Um, but yeah, thanks. Have a good night, mate. Take care. Good.